The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. As a reminder, I ask all members keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized. The staff have been instructed not to mute members except where a member is not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members are also reminded that they may only participate in one remote proceeding at a time. If you are participating today, please keep your camera on. And if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. Before we begin today's hearing, I would like to take a moment to congratulate Representative Jake Auchincloss, who has recently been elected by committee Democrats to serve as the committee's vice chair for this Congress. Mr. Auchincloss has dedicated his career to public service, having served in the Marines and then as a three-term city councilman in Newton, Massachusetts. I know he shares my passion for affordable housing, and I've been very impressed with his level of engagement and thoughtfulness on committee issues. So I'm pleased he will be serving as of next week as the committee's vice chair, and I look forward to working with him in his new role. I now recognize myself for four minutes uh, to give an opening statement. Welcome Chairman Harper and Acting Comptroller Sue, and welcome back Chairman Mac Williams and Vice Chairman Quarles. A major focus of this committee continues to be the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. Today, I expect to hear from our witnesses about what their agencies are doing to respond to this ongoing crisis and what they're going to make sure uh, to, they're going to make sure that banks and credit unions are not further harming consumers, especially people of color, who are already facing challenges through no fault of their own as a result of the pandemic. And those institutions are instead helping consumers and supporting the recovery of communities and people of color whenever possible. I've long been critical of the long list of harmful deregulatory actions taken by the last administration's appointees and particularly their actions to roll back key Dodd-Frank reforms and other consumer protections. So I'm pleased that the Senate has taken bipartisan action to reverse the OCC's harmful so-called true lender rule that would allow non-bank lenders to skirt state interest rate protections. And I have called on House leadership to take up that Congressional Review Act resolution as soon as possible. I'm also pleased that the Biden administration's appointees are bringing a better approach to regulation that prioritizes consumers and that regulators are starting to take steps to protect the financial ability or stability of our system against climate risk and other threats. Vice Chair Qualls, I'm alarmed by reports the Fed is planning to weaken its bank merger review process, one that already amounts to a rubber stamping process. Additionally, Fed Chairman Brainerd has expressed concerns about concentration in the $250 to $700 billion asset size category. And I would note this should not be surprising given the various rollbacks we've seen on large bank capital, liquidity, and other safeguards. Regulators must reverse course immediately to promote financial stability. So I look forward to hearing about what prudential regulators are doing, about banking deserts where bank branches have closed, leaving communities with less access to traditional banking services. I was pleased to learn the OCC under acting Comptroller Sue's leadership announced yesterday that they are reconsidering Joseph Auding's harmful Community Reinvestment Act rule. Modern day redlining has left communities of color with limited access to much needed 
financial services. So policymakers must act with urgency to address these issues. I'm also eager to hear from our panel regarding their agency's efforts on diversity and inclusion in the banking sector, including their work to support minority depository institutions and community development financial institutions during this pandemic. Lastly, I wanna make clear that temporary regulated exemptions or delays for banks that were put in place for the pandemic must come to an end and be allowed to expire. The previous administration attempted to use the pandemic as a cover to delay or weaken key financial safeguards and regulations, and those efforts must not be allowed to stand. So I wanna thank you, and I look forward to the testimony from all of our witnesses and I will now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for four minutes. Well, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to start by welcoming the regulators back today. Uh, some familiar faces and some new. Uh, Chair McWilliams, uh, Vice Chair Quarles, I'd like to again thank you for your work throughout the pandemic to ensure our financial system remains strong. Your quick and decisive action to provide Appropriate flexibility for financial institutions and consumers set up for us a very strong economic rebound here in the United States. Mr. Sue, I also want to welcome you to the committee and your new roles acting comptroller of currency. Uh, however, I think it's safe to say that many of us expected to hear from the confirmed comptroller of the currency at this point. There's been a lot of speculation about who President Biden's nominee will be. It seems to be a Goldilocks approach here. First, Michael Barr was deemed too conservative. If you can uh, call somebody who helped write Dodd-Frank as uh, a conservative, I don't think so. Then uh, Marissa uh, Baradari, uh, who advocates for socializing banking and opposes innovation, well, she seemed to, to appease the far left progressives, but still no formal nomination. So we're left to wonder who will be deemed as, quote, safe and sound, at least in the eyes of Mr. Biden, to permanently fill the role. But indecision has real world consequences. As President Biden tries to cater to his party's political whims, the OCC and our financial institutions are left without a clear path forward. That's problematic. Former Comptroller Odding and former Acting Comptroller Brooks made great strides in a nonpartisan, non ideological way to remove regulatory roadblocks and support financial inclusion through innovation. But now these positive steps forward are stuck in limbo or worse, in danger of being scrapped altogether for political optics. This is not the right way to regulate, but I fear this is just the start of Democrats' one-party rule mentality in practice. We know that Democrats' tendency is to overregulate when they feel like they need to do something. We saw this in 2009 and 10 with Dodd-Frank, and we know the negative impact it had on our financial institutions and our economy. We're already seeing Democrats uh, treat the COVID pandemic just like the financial crisis, but the two are not comparable and our economy is in a much different place now. What my Democrat colleagues should take away from the pandemic is that outsized uh, uh, financial, um, outsized regulation uh, is problematic um, and that financial technology plays a really important role in our day-to-day -day lives and should be embraced. We should use advances in technology to help bring more unbanked and underbanked Americans into the fold and to close banking deserts, just as the chair says. Uh, the OCC and the FDIC under Chair McWilliams worked to address the overly burdensome mandates that hindered financial technology by issuing rules to address the so-called valid when made doctrine. That was positive and helpful to our economy. The OCC also moved to finalize its true lender rule creating a much needed framework for providing affordable credit to all consumers, particularly those who need it most through banks and non-banks. Together, these rules help bring more Americans under the banking umbrella. That's good. We should build on these gains rather than trying to relitigate 2009. I don't think that's the right approach. So I look forward to hearing from each of you on how we can best accomplish that. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much.
Uh, Madam Chair, you muted yourself. Did you uh, recognize me? Yes, Mr. Perlmutter, you're on. Thank you very much. And I want to thank our witnesses for appearing today and thank you for your service to the United States of America. The pandemic served as the ultimate stress test for the financial system. And unlike my friend from uh, North Carolina, it demonstrated how important Dodd-Frank is for the stability of our economy. The capital, liquidity, and other regulatory requirements we require of financial institutions helped weather a period of historic uncertainty and fear. But I would caution, we are not out of the storm yet. Many families are struggling to find childcare as parents re-enter the workforce, supply chain disruptions have slowed outputs, and we still need to get more Americans vaccinated. Meanwhile, there has been some volatility and recklessness in the financial markets. Multiple banks just lost billions by allowing Archegos to gamble with their money. Retail traders are battling hedge funds over GameStop, and a $75 billion cryptocurrency's value fluctuates based on Saturday Night Live guest performances. Maintaining stability in our financial sector is critical to a strong and far-reaching recovery, and I urge all of our witnesses today to keep a close eye on their supervised firms to ensure operations of banks and credit unions are safe and sound, and I look forward to the discussion today, and I yield back. And now... One moment, what's happening? I now recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. We call the witnesses for being here as well today, and the four of you are testifying at a very interesting time with our economy and within the banking system. As the economy is set to recover from the pandemic, I have a number of concerns. The enormous stimulus bill recently passed and continued unemployment benefits have created threats of inflation in an environment where all small businesses uh, cannot find workers. Throughout the pandemic, banks have been providing forbearance to customers to ensure that they can make it through the pandemic. As much of this forbearance is set to expire, it is critical that we examine how regulators will treat these assets going forward. The rise of fintechs has raised significant questions on the chartering of financial institutions, the identity of the true lender of a loan, and whether these entities should be regulated on a federal level. Banking regulation is also shifting with a focus on risk mitigation related to climate risk, which if unchecked could result in a choke point style impact on legally operating companies in the energy sector. These are just a few of the issues I look forward to discussing with you today. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. It is now time to welcome today's distinguished witnesses to the committee. First, we have the Honorable Todd Harper, the Chairman of the National Credit Union Administration. And I understand that today happens to be Mr. Harper's birthday. So I wanna take a moment to say happy birthday and thank you for being with us on your very special day. I hope this isn't the only celebration you're planning for today. <laughs> Next, we have Mr. Michael Sue the acting comptroller of the currency. Next, we have the Honorable Yolena McAdams, the chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Last, we have the Honorable Randall Quarles, the vice chairman of supervision for the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. Each of you will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. You should be able to see a timer on your screen that will indicate how much time you have left and a time will go off at the end of your time. I would ask you to be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony if you hear the chime. Mr. Harper, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss the credit union industry's performance and the NCUA's operations. As a former Hill staffer who spent more than a decade working for this committee, I am deeply honored to join you today. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic's many economic blows, 
the overall credit union system has remained on a solid footing with strong capital levels and sufficient liquidity. If past recessions are indicative, it seems likely that credit union performance will trail any labor market improvements by up to two years. The NCUA and credit unions should, therefore, prepare for that eventuality. Once forbearance programs expire, we will likely experience decreases in credit quality and increases in delinquencies and charge-offs, which will affect credit union financial statements and, if failures occur, could impact the share insurance fund. Tragically, the pandemic has disproportionately affected low-income households, communities of color, and minority-owned businesses. The NCUA has encouraged credit unions to work with members experiencing hardship. The NCUA has also instructed examiners to refrain from criticizing a credit union's efforts to provide prudent relief for members. Through the Community Development Revolving Loan Fund, the NCUA is supporting low-income credit unions during these uncertain times. Although relatively small, these grants and loans make a big difference. In all, the NCUA awarded $3.7 million last year to 162 credit unions to assist in their pandemic response efforts. Although many more applied for a grant, the agency could not fund the demand because of limited appropriations. The pandemic has also prompted a heightened cybersecurity stance at our agency. As part of the larger government-wide effort, the NCOA will continue bolstering its cybersecurity posture and provide guidance and resources to assist credit unions with strengthening their cyber defenses, including grants and completing a pilot project to harmonize IT and cybersecurity exam procedures. The NCOA is further working to strengthen its consumer financial protection program and ensure fair and equitable access to credit. This year, there is an increased emphasis on fair lending compliance and the agency staff are studying methods for improving consumer financial protection supervision for the largest credit unions, not primarily supervised by the CFPB. Additionally, since opening its Office of Minority and Women in Inclusion a decade ago, the agency has made steady progress in advancing diversity. Last year, two out of every five new hires at the NCUA were people of color, and the agency achieved parity in executive gender diversity. The NCUA will continue to invest in diversity and inclusion by enhancing support for minority depository institutions and fostering initiatives that close the wealth gap. These efforts will advance economic equity and justice within the system and ensure a more equitable recovery. Finally, I want to highlight three areas where legislative action would aid the agency in fulfilling its mission. First, FSOC, the GAO, and the NCUA's Inspector General have each called for the NCUA to have examination and enforcement authority over third-party vendors. The continued transfer of operations to credit union service organizations and other third parties diminishes the NCUA's ability to assess risks within the system, leaving thousands of credit unions, millions of their members, and billions of dollars in assets potentially exposed to unnecessary risks. Congress should close this growing regulatory blind spot. Second, Congress should provide the NCUA with greater authority to proactively manage the share insurance fund. Adopting a counter-cyclical approach to charging premiums would allow for an increase in insurance reserves during economic upturns to cover losses during downturns. And third, Congress should permanently adopt the temporary enhancements granted to the NCUA's central liquidity facility in the CARES Act. Because of these reforms, the CLF's borrowing capacity has grown greatly, and four out of every five credit unions now have access to liquidity if other sources free up, uh, freeze up. Permanence would strengthen the shock absorbers for future liquidity events. We will provide the committee with more information on each of these matters in the coming weeks. In conclusion, the NCUA remains focused on addressing the needs and best interests of credit union members, ensuring the safety and soundness of credit unions, and protecting the share insurance fund. I look forward to working with the committee in some report of these endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harper. Next, we will go to Mr. Sue. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Mr. Sue? Can 
Is Mr. Sue on the platform? I see him. I think he's having trouble. Can we signal to them? Yeah. 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 We can kind of hear him. Can you can you hear me now? Mr. Sue, I can hear you now. Okay, okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, okay. Chairwoman uh, Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm honored by Secretary Yellen's confidence to appoint me to this post of acting controller of the currency. I'm a career public servant and a bank supervisor at my core. My 19 years of experience and multiple agencies have spanned periods of growth, crisis, reform, and recovery. I have seen the benefits that financial innovation and competition can bring, as well as the harm that excessive risk-taking can inflict on families, businesses, and the economy. My written testimony shares in more detail my priorities in the review of key regulatory actions that I initiated upon taking office. I see four urgent problems requiring immediate attention. First, guarding against complacency. Second, reducing inequality. Third, adapting to digitalization. And fourth, acting on climate change. Let me briefly describe each. First, I believe the banking system is at risk of becoming complacent, especially the large banks. Banks deserve credit for weathering the pandemic well. I'm concerned, however, that as the economy recovers and pressure to grow returns, overconfidence leading to complacency is a risk when prudent risk management is set aside in pursuit of profit. I see the losses related to Archegos primarily through this lens as reflective of the broader environment. This risk requires bank leaders, boards of directors, and us as supervisors to be especially vigilant. Second, reducing inequality must be a national priority. As the recently published SHED report from the Federal Reserve shows, the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on vulnerable groups, especially minority households and businesses. The recovery threatens to leave them and rural communities even further behind. Historically, many low-income individuals have been treated by banks as either credits to be avoided or credits to be exploited. The OCC can help address that problem. We must work to strengthen regulations implementing the Community Reinvestment Act. I have asked staff to review the OCC's 2020 final rule. All options are under consideration, including rescinding or substantially revising it and working with the Federal Reserve and FEIC on a joint proposal. We must also use all our supervisory tools to ensure banks comply with fair lending and anti-discrimination laws. Predatory lending has no place in our national banking system. Finally, we have an opportunity to expand project reach an OCC-sponsored effort that brings together leaders of banks, civil rights and community groups, tech companies, and businesses to solve problems like credit invisibility, the home ownership gap, and access to capital for minority-owned businesses. Third, we financial regulators must collectively adapt to the digitalization of banking and finance. I am concerned that the regulatory community is taking a fragmented agency-by-agency -agency approach to the technology-driven changes taking place today. At the OCC, the focus has been on encouraging responsible innovation. For instance, we updated the framework for chartering national banks and trust companies and interpreted crypto custody services as part of the business of banking. I've asked staff to review these actions. With regards to charters, some are concerned that providing charters to FinTech will convey the benefits of banking without its responsibility. Others are concerned that refusing to charter FinTechs will encourage growth of another shadow banking system outside the reach of regulators. I share both of these concerns. Recognizing the OCC's unique authority to grant charters, we must find a way to consider how fintech and payment platforms fit into the banking system. We must do it in coordination with the FDIC, Federal Reserve, and the states. Finally, we must act on climate change. I believe the OCC can help most if it adopts a two-pronged approach. First, we must engage with and learn from others. I've asked staff to explore joining the Network for Greening the Financial System, a group of central banks and supervisors from across the globe who share best practices. Second, we must support the development and adoption of effective climate risk management practices at banks. 
The OCC's approach to date has been focused on monitoring. I have asked staff to develop options for taking more concrete action. We will be proactive in this space and act with a sense of urgency. Finally, my testimony outlines a review of key regulatory standards and pending matters that I initiated upon becoming Acting Comptroller. Those items include the 2020 CRA final rule, interpretive letters and guidance related to cryptocurrencies and digital assets, and pending licensing decisions. In all stages of the review, I will keep an open mind. I expect the review to conclude this summer, and we will evaluate findings and determine our next steps. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sue. Next, we will go to Ms. Mac Williams. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman of Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. While banking sector income for 2020 declined from 2019, primarily due to higher provision expenses resulting from CECL implementation and economic uncertainty associated with the pandemic, fourth quarter net income rose, reflecting higher non-interest income and lower provision expenses for credit losses consistent with economic improvement and a more optimistic economic outlook. Despite the challenges of the pandemic, banks increased their capital levels in 2020 and continued to accommodate a sharp increase in deposits, reflecting persistently high savings rates and lower spending. Banks of all sizes have also continued to support their communities, including by originating the overwhelming majority of approximately $800 billion in PPP loans. While the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination program and the reopening of the economy make us cautiously optimistic that things will return to normal, whatever this new normal may look like, we continue to carefully monitor conditions in the banking sector from commercial real estate to agricultural and consumer lending to cybersecurity. While we have focused heavily on ensuring that consumers have access to credit during the pandemic and that banks continue to operate in a safe and sound manner, we have continued several regulatory initiatives along the way as well. Last December, the FDIC board approved a final rule updating our broker deposits regulations to address the evolution of how banks offer services and products since the original broker deposits rule were promulgated 30 years ago. We also finalized a rule to codify legally enforceable commitments of insured industrial banks and industrial loan companies and their parent companies. The rule ensures that the parent company serves as a source of financial strength for the ILC while providing clarity about the FDIC's supervisory expectations of both the ILC and its parent company. This past January, we finalized guidelines establishing a new Office of Supervisory Appeals to help promote consistency among examiners and ensure accountability at the FDIC. We continue to promote innovation at the agency and across the banking sector because it is necessary. The pandemic has only amplified how critical innovation is in our everyday activities, from the way we procure food, to our social contact, to how and where we work. Our focus on innovation is aimed at ensuring that American banks remain competitive in a rapidly changing world, that American consumers have access to a broad array of financial products and services, that our supervisory and risk monitoring functions can appropriately align with technological changes in the industry, that we can bring unbanked Americans into the financial fabric of this country and do so in a way that will promote a path to, to economic and social inclusion. My focus on economic inclusion is informed in no small part by my personal experience as a struggling immigrant in this country. This July will mark my 30th anniversary in the United States. I can assure you that a day has not gone by without me thinking of those early years when putting food on my table and having a roof over my head required working three to four minimum wage jobs. It is from this perspective that the uneven impact of the pandemic and its recovery on different populations throughout the United States has been especially worrisome. Notwithstanding meaningful improvements in recent years in reaching the last mile of unbanked households in this country, we know that much remains to be done. To help address these disparities, the FDIC is using its authorities to support a safer, fairer, and more inclusive banking system. We have recently launched a targeted public awareness campaign, hashtag GetBanked, to inform consumers about the benefits of developing a banking relationship. 
In addition, we announced the establishment of the Mission Driven Bank Fund to channel private sector investments to support minority depository institutions and CDFIs. We have also recently released a new diversity strategic plan with actionable steps that will guide our work and help measure our progress over the next few years and support economic inclusion in our communities. As the FDIC makes progress on these issues, we will continue to fulfill our critical mission of maintaining stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. And I look forward to your questions and happy birthday, Todd. Thank you, Ms. Mac Williams. Next, we will go to Mr. Qualls. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee. Thanks for the invitation to testify today. Uh, last May, my colleagues and I came before you to discuss our actions to maintain a strong banking sector as a source of support for consumers, households, and businesses. My remarks at that time came after the onset of sudden and pervasive financial stress. Early turmoil in overseas markets quickly crossed borders and within days had, had reached almost every asset class and corner of the financial system. A year ago, the full implications of the COVID event still remained unclear and the costs would continue to mount. Today, the storm waters are receding. The economy is beginning a strong recovery to the other side of the COVID event. And as the Federal Reserve's recent reports detail, banking organizations have remained an important source of strength in this recovery. Higher levels of capital and liquidity, better risk management, more robust systems, let banking organizations absorb an unprecedented shock while providing refuge from market instability, delivering essential public aid, and working constructively to support borrowers and communities. In short, the full set of post-2008 reforms, as refined and recalibrated by the work of the last four years, ensured that this time truly would be different than the last. Today, the U.S. banking system is actually more liquid and better capitalized than it was a year ago. And on top of that has over $100 billion in additional loan loss reserves, leaving it well positioned to weather future shocks. While a strong recovery is underway, it's not yet complete. Our role as policymakers is to support the financial system and the economy through the end of this transition back to normal operations. Our challenge is to do so as circumstances change and the nation's need for that support evolves. Most immediately, We've worked to align our emergency actions with other relief efforts as the economic situation improves, maintaining or extending some measures where appropriate to preserve household assistance to promote continued access to credit, and starting the transition back to our normal activities and normal supervisory posture and our normal rule book. However, our role and responsibility extend much further than merely returning to normal. We have an obligation to look closely at the last year to understand how the financial system came to experience such severe stress and to identify and act on any lessons we find. Any list of lessons must begin with the strong performance of supervisory stress testing. The stress testing program not only prepared banks for a period of prolonged hardship, it also clarified their health and resilience as the COVID event progressed. This role affirmed the ways that stress testing has evolved in recent years into a more flexible, more transparent anchor for the Federal Reserve's broader capital program. For example, while it was sensible, given that this was the first real world test of the post 2008 system for us to impose temporary capital distribution restrictions beyond those that are built into this system, we now know that the system works, especially when supplemented and informed by a real time stress testing machine. In the future, having learned the lessons of this real world test, we'll be able to rely on the automatic restrictions of our carefully developed framework, rather than impose ad hoc and roughly improvised limitations. Other areas, however, are ripe for closer examination. These include strains in short-term funding markets and the second destabilizing run on prime money market mutual funds in roughly a decade, treasury markets where last year's selling pressures overwhelmed dealers' willingness or ability to intermediate, and changing patterns in the use of financial services by consumers and businesses. These trends predate the COVID event, but the past year accelerated them dramatically with important implications for financial stability, safety, uh, soundness, consumer protection, and underserved communities' access to safe and fair financial services. In our work to understand each of these trends, we have valuable and willing partners in our fellow regulators in other agencies and in our colleagues abroad. And we're committed to keep, keeping Congress closely and actively informed of our efforts. This work is critical, but only in service of a more fundamental goal, 
a safe, transparent, and efficient approach to supervision and regulation, which ensures the financial system can withstand even historic shocks. Those values are of perennial importance. They continue to be the bedrock of the Federal Reserve's work, animating two of our highest priorities for this year, finalizing the post-crisis Basel III reforms and completing the long overdue transition away from LIBOR. The COVID event is not behind us and the vulnerabilities it exposed are not gone. But as we now follow the path out from this event, the Fed is working to ensure the financial system is resilient enough to support consumers, households, and businesses, and recommit ourselves to supporting the economy through the completion of the recovery. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Qualls. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Chair Harper, I appreciate that early in your tenure at the NCUA, you have stressed the importance of consumer financial protection. You recently gave a speech cautioning credit unions to consider the reputational risk they face when they garnish portions of stimulus checks being deposited in a customer's account. Specifically, you said, and I quote, as we saw with stimulus payments last year, some credit unions decided to garnish those funds instead of stepping up and working with their members. Credit unions that do this again should consider the reputational issues that will come from these practices, quote unquote. Have credit unions been responsive to your message to help their customers who have been hurt through no fault of their own during this pandemic? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And what I would say is that in this latest round of uh, the economic stimulus package, the credit unions have been indeed stepping up. I'm aware that uh, both major trade groups within the industry have uh, called on Congress, one, to work to close the, the problems related to garnishment, and two, individual credit unions are working to make sure that people can use these funds in order to pay for shelter, food, and medical needs, which is what Congress intended. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think I heard you say uh, that you were concerned about post-pandemic uh, foreclosures and the possibility that uh, the credit unions are going to be faced uh, with the situation of homeowners and not being able to pay their mortgages. But what I did not hear was you talk about loan modifications and how you're going to deal with that. That's a really important question, Congresswoman. The, the latest data that we have internally at the agency is that there have been uh, 1.3 million forbearance uh, efforts that have gone on uh, since the start of the pandemic, and that we've actually worked to modify about uh, $38 billion in loans. Um, going forward, we're going to continue to stress to our examiners and to credit unions the need to work with members and that prudent workouts can be a win-win, both for the consumer as well as for the credit union who might have to bear a ch uh, charge off and foreclosure costs. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chair Mac Williams, some banks have garnished uh, wages uh, also. Is that correct? Um, I We actually... Um I, I, well, I'm, I'm sure there is a bank that has garnished wages. I don't know that we have uh, broad data points on that. But uh, as, as we have encouraged banks to work with their customers, and we have also identified some activities such as waiving fees uh, through that process as eligible for consideration under the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, as a general matter, we do not base recommendations on reputational risk. So we have not, uh, to, your, to your point uh, and the question to Mr. Harper, uh, we have not issued any guidance on that with that respect, but we did issue a number of guidance documents uh, telling banks that they should work with their borrowers uh, and also making sure that we, our examiners, not criticize banks for working with borrowers affected by COVID in a safe and sound manner. And uh, institutions generally that have not needed to categorize COVID-related loans uh and modifications of such as tdr so we have done a number of things to make sure that uh, borrowers can stay in their homes and that the issue of forbearance and loan modifications is not something that uh um, would i guess force consumers out of their houses thank you uh chair harper i'm concerned about reports that banks are closing branches at a record place pace and now in some areas the nearest bank branch might be over 10 miles away while many customers bank online, the FDIC found 83% of customers 
still met with a tailor or bank employee at least once during 2019, and more than 40% of rural customers made at least 10 visits to a bank. What are these customers supposed to do when the bank leaves town? Thank you, and I, and I share your concern about financial deserts. I think we might have lost Ms. Waters. Uh, I share your concern about uh, financial deserts uh, and the need to step in and make sure that those communities have access to financial services. You know, when, when a financial institution leaves a town, it can be really debilitating. Uh, and what I'm aware of is many credit unions have been stepping up through adding underserved areas, particularly the one charter type, uh, multiple common bond, to provide uh, services in those areas where there might have been left behind. And I think that's something that we should be continuing to work to do, and we're doing through our access initiative currently. Oh, quickly, for example, should we allow a credit union to expand this field of membership to set up a branch in areas where there are no physical branches? Uh, that is something that would certainly be helpful. The NCUA board and its members have long uh, called upon Congress to allow not just multiple common bond credit unions to add underserved areas, but also single common bond and community charters. That would be a good way potentially to help provide service to those areas. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Mrs. Wagner, is now recognized for five minutes. I thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I thank our prudential regulators. I only wish that we were all in person in the committee room. Uh, it would make this much easier since we are actually all on the Hill, just ab above or next to uh, the hearing room in our offices. Uh, I have a number of questions, uh, so I'd ask you to please keep your questions brief. Vice Chair Quarles. As we've started to move uh, out of this pandemic, my constituents are seeing an increase in the cost of groceries, gas, and many, many other household items. Manufacturers and other industries are dealing with supply shortages and workforce shortages and unprecedented costs for raw materials. What economic signals give you reason to believe that these price spikes are only temporary? Uh, well, uh, the uh, emergence of uh, uh, from any sort of a, a natural disaster or a, a uh, suddenly imposed constraint on economic activity uh, is historically generally uh, accompanied by uh, temporary increases in prices, sometimes uh, quite significant uh, in the uh, in the emergence from those types of events. This is a very large one. And so we would expect uh, those types of temporary dislocations to be substantial. Uh, I, I think the question, uh, I, well, so you've asked me to be brief, so I, I can leave it at that and see if you want to follow up. So I, I yes, uh, yes, well, with, with, as I said, the supply chain and raw material costs being so backed up and demand so high, um, we're questioning the, the temporary nature of this, and I would like the Fed to consider that. Acting Comptroller Sue, could you briefly explain your views on climate change and bank supervision? Okay, this isn't going to work. So, Mr. Sue, or Comptroller Sue, I'll, I'll, I'll hang on. Vice Chair Quarles, back to you. What data is necessary to understand climate risks for supervisory purposes? Uh, well, there, there's a range of data, and I can't, uh, uh, well, I can't give you a comprehensive answer to that question because we're in the process of sort of very analytically and uh, comprehensively looking at that question inside the Federal Reserve right now. Really? We, yes, we think that these, uh, you know, that the question of risk uh, should be that should be an analytical one. It should not be solved by a priori concerns. We should look very closely at what the data actually show. We're in the early stages of developing a framework in order to uh, uh, in order to determine what's the right data. How should Vice, we? Vice, if I can interrupt, Vice Chair sure. Quarles, um, how will an increased focus on climate change impact the Fed's ability to fulfill its dual mandate mandate of price stability and maximum employment? So uh, I wouldn't say there has been an increased focus on climate change. There's been an interior, there's been an increased uh, focus from the outside of the Fed on uh, you know how we are looking at climate change as one of the many risks to the potential risk to the financial system uh, that we evaluate. Uh, but we Glad have to hear focus. Thank you. I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, 
Chairman uh, McWilliams, in your testimony, you mentioned that the FDIC will continue to monitor the impact of climate and other emerging risks on the financial sector. I'm wondering, what sort of risk management structure does the FDIC have in place to support a financial institution's risk management practices? And I guess, in other words, does the FDIC have the proper tools to assess risk on climate events such as hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, and floods to the financial performance of the banks you examine and supervise? Congresswoman Wagner, that's a, that's a great question. Um, FDIC supervisors have long expected financial institutions to consider and appropriately address potential climate risks that could arise in their operating environment as a meaningful safety and stand, uh, soundness uh, concern. But if, if, I could, if, I could interrupt, if I could interrupt, what is the risk management structure that you have to support uh, these management practices? So, we, well, we look at whether or not the institutions and its borrowers have appropriate insurance coverage. Are they adjusting borrowers' cash flow estimates based on reduced agricultural yields or adverse business conditions? Are we looking, are they complying with applicable rules, regulations, building codes, especially in areas, uh, for example, peril of wind may be a concern. Um, our economists and financial anal analysts conduct internal analysis of factors that affect economic and banking conditions, including the potential implications of changing environmental conditions. So, so we look at all of that. We also have FDIC regional risk committees that include environmental I think my, and their I regular think my analysis. Um, Councilor Sue, I will try and submit my question uh, to you. Hopefully you can work out your technical difficulties. This is why we should be in the committee room. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Lynch, you now have the gavel. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, the reason why we don't have in-person hearings is right here. The list of Republicans who have not been vaccinated, 97 out of 211. I have a responsibility, and we all have a responsibility, to protect ourselves and to protect our staff. So, uh, Vice Chair Qualls, the Fed's most recent financial stability report published earlier this month found that vulnerabilities arising from business debt has fallen since the middle of last year. How have government support programs like the PPP, the Fed's Paycheck Protection Program, liquidity uh, facility, and those in the American Rescue Plan help to reduce uh, this vulnerability, stabilize businesses, and improve the overall economy? Uh, well, I, I, I think it's, it's clear that the various programs that have uh, been put in place, uh, uh, given the size of the shock that was experienced last, last March, we would have uh, uh, experienced a much deeper and more durable uh, uh, economic contraction uh, and would have had uh, more lasting economic scarring uh, with closed businesses uh, and defaulting uh, obligations than had those uh, programs not been put in place. I think that's inaugurable. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, um, Mr. Quarles, uh, the report also points out that many small businesses and households remain financially strained and job losses over the past year have been heavily concentrated among our most financial vulnerable. So including many lower wage workers and racial and ethnic minorities, what threats does a K-shaped or uneven recovery pose to financial stability? Um, I, well, I would say that uh, to the, that precise question, what threat does it pose to financial stability? Uh, you know, obviously, if there is a uh, you know significant portion of the populace uh, that uh, experiences economic stress, even as the overall economy uh, is doing well, uh, that can feed into losses on a cohort of uh, exposures in the financial system that uh, uh, that could have consequences. I'd say, at least, I, I would say right now that that question is probably less of a financial stability question, however, mm -hmm. uh, given the, the nature and size that we see of that possible effect and more a question of 
of uh, fairness and, uh, and, and policy as to uh, what should be done about those exposures. So you do agree that we need to address uh, systemic inequities in many aspects of our economy, don't you? Yeah, I, I think that where there are, um, uh, I think that we do need to ensure that uh, uh, opportunities are equal uh, and that uh, access to financial services uh, is fair and equal across the country. That's a high priority for the uh, for the Federal Reserve and our supervision of financial Thank systems. You. Thank you. Uh, Acting Comptroller Sue, yesterday the OCC announced that it will reconsider last year's rule implementing the Community Reinvestment Act and that lenders should also stop preparing for the regulation to take effect. Can you explain this decision and do you plan to pursue a joint rulemaking with the Fed and the FDIC? Sure. Um, so upon taking office, uh, I had to, can you hear me? I just want to make sure the audio is yes, okay. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so upon taking office, um, uh, we had identified uh, several standards and pending matters uh, that I thought would be ripe for some review. And with regard to the CRA specifically, um, due to effects of the pandemic uh, on populations, uh, due to the comments on the Federal Reserve's ANPR, on CRA, uh, and due to some of our experience with partial implementation of the 2020 rule, uh, we had enough information to say, this seems like the right time to reconsider um, uh, where we are. And so I initiated a review. So the review has not been complete yet. So I don't wanna get in front of the conclusions of that. Um, I'm saying that I wanna take all of the facts and all of the perspectives into account before deciding what to do. That could include rescission. That could include joining the Fed and the FDIC. That uh, overwhelming comments that we got. So uh, we're open to those things. I appreciate you re reconsider. I yield back. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, for five minutes. Mr. Lucas, you. Okay, we're gonna go. Is Mr. Lucas or Mr. Posey, you wanna speak or no? All right, I'll, I'll, I'll step up here. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Quarles, uh, just last week, the April inflation rate was reported at 4.2%, the highest since 2009. The rate in March was 2.6%. Are we paying the price of monetizing a huge debt? Uh, what the late Dr. Friedman and former Chair Bernanke both call helicopter money? Um, well, I, I, I don't think so. Um, if you look at the, I mean, I mean, if you look at the example you gave, uh, that the, the inflation rate last month was the highest, highest since 2009, I think that is an example of when you come out of a shock, uh, you can see volati uh, volatility in an inflation rate. And that volatility, we would generally uh, expect to be temporary and, and transitory, given that the size of the shock that we are coming out of from the COVID event uh, is even larger, materially larger. Uh, than from the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, those sorts of dislocations, it would not be surprising if they were both sizable and lasted for some period. I think the, I think the key point is, if we're wrong, uh, you know, I, I believe that that's the correct analysis of the situation. If we're wrong, do we have the tools to address it as, as we see that the world is evolving differently than we expect? And that is absolutely the case. The Federal Reserve has the tools to address uh, inflationary concerns should they prove uh, to be more durable 
uh, and, and higher uh, than we currently analyze them to be. Thank you. Uh, given the Fed's commitment to independence, uh, please describe the conditions or scenarios under which the Fed stops monetizing the debt. Uh, how would you make that decision? Uh, well, uh, I mean, we have, uh, we uh, analyze the conditions of the, A, obviously I should begin by saying, I don't think we're monetizing the, the debt currently uh, uh, because of uh, uh, dislocations that occurred in the treasury market uh, over the course of 2020. Uh, we are purchasing treasury debt. We have, uh, uh, you know, said that we will be examining over the course of this year, uh, the conditions of the financial markets and when it will be appropriate for us to uh, uh, to end those asset purchases. The Federal Open Market Committee discusses that uh, regularly and and uh, uh, and that will be the mechanism through which we would make that decision. Uh, Mr. Sue, uh, the Senate recently made the true lender rule uh, subject to a Congress Review Act resolution. How does allowing states to regulate interstate loans uh, promote interstate commerce, career choice, and economic welfare? I'm sorry, Congressman Posey, you broke up a little bit at the end. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. What was that again now? <laughs> um, I was asking if you could, you broke up at the end there. I could, I, could you repeat the question quickly? Sure, I just wondered uh, about the Senate recently made a true lender rule subject to a Congressional Review Act resolution. How does allowing states to regulate interstate loans promote interstate commerce, greater choice, and economic welfare? Um, okay, so, so you know, when, when I, when I um, took office, uh, included the true lender rule as part of the review that we were going to do. And when the Senate voted um, uh, to, to repeal it under the Congressional Review, review Act, uh, we paused that review um, uh, because of the congressional deliberation, and we are monitoring um, how the House's deliberation is going. Um, I, I don't want to say too much more than that, if, uh, uh, given the posture. All right. Mr. Harper, could you share your experience with us? Uh, will a higher corporate tax rate attract or discourage investment in job growth? So um, thank you for the question, Congressman. Credit unions are not subject to taxation uh, as they're structured as nonprofit cooperatives that are member owned. So there would not be a change for credit unions. Ms. McWilliams, should the prudential regulators require financial institutions to increase their capital to protect against risk of climate change? I'm sorry, Congressman. I missed the first part of your question. I apologize. Well, I'm running out of time. I just should uh, prudential regulator to require financial institutions to increase their capital to protect against the risk of climate change. I, I generally, as we approach the, the capital and regulations, we like to base it on quantitative measures to understand what's going on. And I think it's premature to make any conclusions in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California. Mr. Sherman, you're now recognized. Rest my case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Let's go back. Ms. Maloney, would you like five minutes for, for questioning? I see yes, you. please, Con please. All right, you thank are now recognized. Thank you to you, uh, Acting Chairman, and to uh, Chair Lady Waters, and to the ranking member. Acting uh, Controller Sue, I was planning to ask about the Community Reinvestment Act, our nation's law that requires financial institutions to invest in and meet the credit needs of all communities, particularly low and moderate income communities. But it is good news. Yesterday, the OACC announced it would reconsider the 2020 final rule, a rule that I believe would significantly weaken the CRA and, and leave our most vulnerable communities behind. So I just want to thank you first to begin with. 
I think that this is a very positive development. Uh, but act, I, I, I would, uh, Acting Controller Sue, as a follow-up to yesterday's announcement and to uh, Congresswoman Velasquez's question, do you believe that our communities would be best served by having one uniform standard across the banking regulators rather than different standards for each regulator and their related financial institutions? So as a general matter, yes. Uh, I think that is definitely the case. I think there are a lot of devilish details here and I'm awaiting the review uh, to get that confirmed. So um, I, I, I just wanna make sure that I think when the, when the agencies act together, uh, the effects are stronger and more sustained. And I think that that's been proven uh, many times. So, so as a general matter, yes. Okay, I, and I'd like to ask you what deficiencies in the final rule led the OCC to make its decision to reconsider the 2020 uh, rulemaking? Ah, um, so, you know, the, I, I think it really comes back to those three factors I cited before, um, which is that you know, the, the impacts of the pandemic, I think, have become much more clear. And so the need uh, is sharpened and we have more data to support that. The comments on the Fed's ANPR, uh, I think there, there are a lot of comments there that we have been uh, following very closely. So there's new information there. And again, part of our experience with the partial implementation of the rule, uh, which has had its ups and downs, I don't know all of the details around that, but the combination of those factors really uh, prompted me and the staff to say, okay, we, we need to reconsider this. Okay, changing to topics. I wanna to touch on climate change and gun violence, and particularly the OCC so-called fair access rulemaking. In the closing days of the Trump administration, Acting Controller Brooks rushed through a rule to effectively requiring financial institutions to lend to and support manufacturers responsible for producing the firearms that have devastated our communities. The rule would also have the effect of requiring financial institutions to support the fossil fuel industry with access to banking services, even if those institutions have voluntarily chosen to stop supporting the financing of, of carbon pollution. On January 19th, I wrote to then President-elect Biden urging him to block this rulemaking and the harm it would cause to our communities. I was pleased to see that this rulemaking was paused the following week. So do you intend to rescind the OCC's fair access rule? Uh, I have no intent to re revisit that rule. It's been paused, it's not live. I have no intent to revisit it. Well, I would say the former acting controller used his authority to rush this through, and now it's paused, but I hope you will use yours to rescind this rulemaking that will devastate our communities. My time has expired and I yield back and I look forward to further questions uh, and comments on this and, and more clarifications on it. I think it should totally be uh, overturned. Anyway, I yield back, thank you. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lutkenmeyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Quarles, uh, a minute ago you said that you know, there's about $100 billion of additional loan loss reserves in the system today, which is good news. Then you made the comment that the vulnerabilities to our system are not gone. And so I'd like for you to expand on what you think those vulnerabilities are, number one, and then in order to um, uh, you know, somehow corral those vulnerabilities uh, or to uh, quantify those vulnerabilities, how effective uh, do we need to be with regards to forbearance? It would seem that with the additional reserves that we have, you could take two different approaches. One is where you would say, well, we have enough reserves here, so let's ride this out. Let's work with the banks and our customers because even if things go south, there's plenty of reserves there. It's not going to impact the, the quality of the banks. Or you could go back to a more punitive approach and say, we've got plenty of reserves there, therefore let's go in, clean these things up, and let's take all of this and apply it to the reserves, and then we got a, a clean slate. Which approach do you do you think you want to go with, and what vulnerabilities, I guess, do you believe are still out there? Uh, so with respect to the uh, approach to borrowers um, uh, that may be under pressure as we emerge from the COVID event, we are continuing our supervisory stance of saying that banks uh, should work with those borrowers. It's your former option rather than the second option of saying, since you have the reserves on your books, uh, 
uh, take the losses and uh, clean up the loans. Uh, that is definitely not our approach. We are, uh, we began during the pandemic and saying that banks should work with their borrowers uh, and that uh, that supervisory stance uh, continues uh, to be in place uh, even as uh, forbearance ends. I, the information we have uh, from our supervision of the banks is that the majority of forbearance has ended uh, and uh, uh, customers have resumed paying. Let me, I'm sorry to interrupt here, but what vulnerabilities do you still see? Uh, so the, the vulnerabilities, you know, potential vulnerabilities are, uh, you know, that again, certain uh, cohorts of uh, borrowers uh, might uh, have um, difficulty paying their loans as forbearance ends. We haven't seen that to be a, uh, an actual fact as opposed to a potential fact yet. Uh, but if it becomes an actual fact, we are encouraging banks to continue to work with those borrowers uh, and not simply uh, uh, close out the loan. Where, where that can be done safely and yeah. soundly. Very good. Thank you for that. Um, Chairwell McWilliams, FDIC is tasked with reviewing and approving applications for the industrial loan companies or LCs. In February of this year, the FDIC issued a final rule to codify the LC process and requires non-financial companies applying for an LC to meet certain conditions prescribed by the FDIC and enter written agreements with the FDIC. I think many members in this committee have concerns with the commingling of banking and commerce that ILCs represent. Do you think the rule as is written today uh, will prevent the commingling of banking and commerce in the future? Well, I think that our final rule certainly goes a long way to impose source of strength requirements on the parent company, which has been a longstanding concern. Uh, and this is cons consistent with the statutory requirements in section 616 of Dodd-Frank. Uh, we're confident that we can adequately supervise ILCs. Uh, we have imposed heightened expectations as warranted, we have higher capital levels in traditional banks on, on these ILCs. We have capital liquidity maintenance agreements, and we have agreements that require parent company to support the ILC uh, at time of distress. Um, now, I would say that the same statutory requirements for all deposit uh, insurance applicants apply as Congress gave them to us. So we're not, um, I would say we, we have, we have uh, finalized a rule to require more of ILCs once they get approved and prior to approval from the parent company and we require supervision of the parent company but in the end we we're only working with the rules that congress gave us uh, and those rules are the same whether you're applying for a de novo banking charter insurance depo deposit insurance or for the ilc uh charter uh deposit insurance so your expectation is then to be able to have some oversight over the parent company as well that's what we that's what we codified in our rulemaking uh um again uh um wanting to make sure that the parent company is liable to support the ILC and serves as the source of strength, uh, both as required by Section 616 of Dodd-Frank, as well as by our internal um, uh, understanding of how ILCs function, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say that, that we're comfortable where we are. Again, it's up to Congress to decide if that's sufficient or not. But as, as a regulator, I'm comfortable where we are. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, just a quick question with regards to the proposed tax plan by the administration. This plan is going to have devastating effects on small businesses with regards to doubling capital gains, raising the uh, the, the tax rate. A million, a million companies are, are listed as C, are structured as C corps. Um, you're looking, um, you know, at at the estate tax, the second estate tax. Gentlemen, time has expired. We'll uh, we'll submit that for the record, Dan. I'm just curious as to your concerns about the tax plan with regards to small businesses. So thank you for that. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, we've gone through two great domestic crises in the last two decades. In 2008, the crisis was caused by the financial system. Uh, this most recent crisis, the financial system didn't cause it. It was caused by a virus, and the financial system has shown remarkable resiliency. Uh, in part because of the regulatory regulatory authorities and rules that we're dealing with here today, and in part because of the uh, tremendous uh, response by Congress. Um, so we got something right. Uh, the financial rules that we had in place in 2008, I don't think would have survived the virus of 2019. Um, and uh, Mr. Quarles, I uh, want to thank you for mentioning uh, LIBOR 
And uh, I especially want to thank uh, you and the Fed for working with me to craft legislation uh, to deal with that problem, hopefully well before uh, the, uh, the problem affects trillions of dollars of outstanding adjustable rate uh, debt instruments. Uh, as to uh, credit unions, I'm uh, pleased that uh, Chairman Harper is, is with us. Um, I uh, want to thank uh, the chair of the full committee for including as part of uh, today's uh, uh, hearing the discussion draft of a bill that would expand credit unions ability to lend to their member businesses in underserved areas and the chairwoman's uh, mention of the uh, uh, fact that perhaps we ought to have uh, credit unions be able to uh, establish uh, branches in uh, our uh, unfortunately growing financial uh, deserts. I want to focus a little bit on the uh, industrial loan companies, which is a matter of prudential regulation, but is more important than just prudential regulation. We've had a rule in our, uh, in our economy for a long time of separating financial services from commerce and industry. Uh, Japan went the other direction, and if you look at their stagnation, particularly in the 80s and 90s, Japan was not served well by mixing the two together. Uh, while the courts and then Congress have allowed the mixing of this financial activity with that financial activity, we have, uh, we have not allowed the mixing of banking and commerce. But we've had the ILCs. They played a very modest role in our economy. Uh, they're historic. They're doing fine unless they're used as a uh, way to blow a hole in what has been this wall for 100 years or nearly 100 years between commerce and banking. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, you know, we end, could end up with Walmart, Amazon, et cetera. I believe the FDIC should be looking at a moratorium on new ILC charters to give Congress time to look more closely at the, uh, the ILC issue. Um, would you be open to considering either a, a temporary moratorium on ILCs or a temporary moratorium on any ILC that, had, that mixes banking and uh, non-financial services? Uh, thank you for that question. And I'll say I'm open to whatever Congress tells us to do. Congressman, I want to make sure that uh, you don't misinterpret my uh, uh, tenacity in making sure that the FDIC follows the law that Congress gave us. For either my love or hate of the ILCs, I don't have feelings about them. I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't think they're great. I don't think they're bad. I just, I just look at the, at the statutory requirements, and I know what Congress has given us. Uh, and should you give us the mandate to put a moratorium in place, we will do so. Should you give us a mandate to do something different with the ILCs, we will absolutely do so. Uh, um, in the in the meantime, we have done what we can with our supervisory tools to make sure that there is safety and soundness in the system. That the parent is on the hook for the for the subsidiary for the insured depository institution, I, I, and that we can prevent very much whether Amazon or Walmart will be as regulated by the FDIC as uh, banks uh, and, uh, the, and, and bank uh, bank holding companies. I do want to uh, turn to uh, uh, Mr. Quarles. Uh, it's critical that we enforce our anti-money laundering and know your customer rules, especially in light of Mr. Uh, President Biden's efforts to collect the hundreds of billions of dollars of uh, uncollected taxes from the top uh, 1%. Um, the Chairman Powell has, has said that the Fed would not proceed with uh, creating a digital- the gentleman's time has expired. I'll make this a question for the record. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I guess I just want to point out, uh, as we start this, one thing to my colleague from New York, another fine piece of journalism where a non-answer is actually an answer when they're talking about vaccinations. None of their damn business. But I, I digress. So uh, I want <laughs> Want to move on to um, the ILCs? I know this has suddenly gotten a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, discussion, 
And uh, Ms. McWilliams, I got a quick question for you, I guess. I want to expand on this a little bit. Is there a widespread problem uh, of the rules not being followed by ILCs currently? Uh, I'm sorry, do you mean with respect to our rules, the FDIC mandated rules? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's some implications that uh, somehow there's, uh, there's rules that are currently in place aren't being followed, or is it, I guess maybe the question is, is, is there a problem that needs to be solved here by Congress or by you as FDIC? I know you would, you would uh, just finalize the rules on that. Um, you know, is there, an, is there a real problem with ILCs as we currently are dealing with? So I would tell you from a regulatory and supervisory perspective, uh, we do not see a problem with our authorities to appropriately supervise the ILCs. Um, again, as I mentioned, we impose the same standards as they get approved as we do for banks. And then once they're approved, we actually impose heightened expectations uh, as warranted based on the risk model um, and, and the profile, business profile of the, uh, of, the, of the entities themselves. This can include significantly higher capital levels in traditional banks. Uh, we also ask them to um, enter into so-called CALMA, capital and liquidity maintenance agreements, where the parent has to uh, not only um, um, agree to our supervision, but also uh, be willing to put in uh, money, capital to support the, the insured depository. And we also have the parent company agreements uh, along the same line. So I would say that we have, um, you have given us uh, adequate tools to appropriately supervise okay. um, ILCs from that perspective. Okay, uh, let's move on to LIBOR. Uh, Mr. Quarles, uh, Vice Chair Quarles, um, I'd like to follow up on our various conversations that we have had with, uh, with LIBOR. Uh, I'm hearing from a number of uh, financial institutions of, of various size uh, across the country regarding the, uh, this transfer, this, uh, this um, transfer away from LIBOR. Uh, many have expressed concerns with SOFR and, uh, and uh, what uh, what that means, you know, this this sort of one size fits all benchmark that uh, that may be out there. What are the specific challenges facing the Federal Reserve regarding LIBOR to SOFR transfer, and does the Fed still believe that SOFR is actually the best uh, fallback rate? Uh, so the, uh, the 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 fundamental position of the Fed with respect to the LIBOR transition is that. Uh, uh, LIBOR is ending. It, it will not be able to be used. We believe it's a safety and soundness concern for it to be used for new contracts after the end of this year. We will uh, supervise firms so that their new contracts cannot be written on it. Firms have to be prepared for that transition. Uh, there will be a significant amount of legacy contracts uh, uh, that will need transition. Uh, federal legislation is likely uh, to be appropriate uh, in that context to help with the legacy. As for SOFR, yeah, all due respect, we know all that. <laughs> okay. I, I need to know. My time is very short here. As for SOFR, the um, uh, SOFR is a is a robust rate developed by a comprehensive. Is it, the best, is it the best rate? Because I'm hearing from some others that they think that there may be some uh, some different directions that this should go. So the, the position of the Federal Reserve is that banks need to be prepared for the transition, not that they must trans transition to a particular rate. Okay. Um, all right. Um, uh, acting Comptroller Sue, um, what the hell is going on at the OCC? <laughs> There's, there is, uh, uh, the administration can't seem to get it quite right on, on the appointments, but um, OCC finalized a rule, uh, the true lender rule, and then a few weeks ago, your predecessor came out in support of that rule. And then shortly after your appointment, the Senate and the White House opposed the rule. Um, so I guess is the change in position suggesting uh, that this is a political decision or is this decision based on data and what's right for consumers? Um, with, with regard to true lender, um, so that we, we were going to review it. But once the Senate voted to repeal it under CRA, we basically stepped back and said, now it's under congressional deliberation. So we are just monitoring Congress's uh, deliberations on the matter. All right. Uh, we'll follow up on some questions as well. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. The chair recogni now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you very much. First thing I want to say is, Happy birthday to Chairman 
Todd Harper. Happy birthday, my friend. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, on yesterday, the House of Representatives passed my bill on financial inclusion. And thanks to a helping hand from Reverend Cleaver and my good friend, French Hill of Arkansas. And um, I um, am deeply concerned about our consumers, as you are, unbanked and underbanked, who are just out here subject to the whims and the ravages of payday lenders. And I was interested to learn of NCU's payday alternative loan program that you all have, which allows federal credit unions to offer lending products that are safer and more affordable than payday lenders. Um, I want you to give me an update on these lending products. Certainly, Congressman. I, the payday alternative loan rule, or PALS for short, has been uh, part of the NCUA's uh, 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 rules for more than a decade now. And what we have found is, is that many credit unions are using it quite prudently. Prudently, uh, They can lend up to 28%, which is slightly higher than the 18% cap imposed for all loans. Um, and they also need to work these loans into an amortized basis. Uh, so our payday alternative loan program is working well. Um, and it's something that we have certainly seen a number of credit unions use during this crisis. I'll also note just very quickly, many credit unions are offering small dollar loans well under the 18% cap outside of the payday lending program. And so they are stepping up to serve their members. Let me ask you this, because I have a sort of a Archelius heel in this moment. And my concern comes back to the unbank and underbank. <clears throat> And though this product that you have is available to credit union members, uh, how do consumers who are not members of a credit union have access to a product like this? How do we get it down to those who need it the most? I appreciate the question and the desire to expand access to financial services. I know that uh, former Chairman Hood, now board member Hood at the agency, has spoken often about financial inclusion. One of the ways and things we could do is to step up, and we have agency staff working on this right now, to improve our database to help consumers find a particular loan or an institution at a, a credit union to which they can join. That is certainly one way in which we can attack this problem. And certainly our bill passing uh, the House on yesterday brings in the um, Consumer Financial Protection <clears throat> Services. And I'd like for you to help us to get the word out on that, to get our bill passed, because while yours is targeted to uh, uh, folks that need the help, uh, it's, it's exclusive only to credit union members, correct? That is correct, is that, if I understand the question, yes. Okay. Now, Ms. Uh, McWilliams, let me ask you this. I think I may have a moment. How are your regulated banks preparing to handle loans emerging from forbearance? We have passed the American Rescue Plan, and we have a piece in there um, uh, that would help and allow loan forbearance for those impacted from the pandemic uh, hardships. What steps are you taking that ensures these loans remain sound? So we have done, thank you for that question. We have done a number of things at the FDIC to make sure that banks actually uh, appropriately modify loans um, and we also went to, the, to great lengths to make sure that loans modified for the purposes of the pandemic that were performing before the pandemic that were modified uh, in, in a safe and sound manner actually do not qualify as trouble debt restructuring. 
Thank you, ma'am. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Bo uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank uh, Chairwoman Waters. I don't know if she's still here, but I want to thank her for raising a question about the decline in physical bank branches in rural and underserved areas. Uh, that may be why the majority uh, attached to this hearing a bill requiring a study on de novo bank formation. I think we can all agree that reversing the trend in lackluster de novo formation is a worthy policy goal and could address the decline in rural bank branches, as Chair McWilliams uh, knows very, very well. But we can do better than a study. Uh, my bill, the Promoting Access to Capital and Underbanked Communities Act, is a straightforward solution endorsed by the ICBA, allowing for a phase-in of capital requirements for de novo institutions, including some provisions targeted toward underserved rural areas and several other common sense provisions to promote bank access in unbanked communities. Rather than simply study the issue, let's do something about it. I will put my request to Chairwoman Waters formally in a letter, but I would encourage the majority, everyone on this Zoom call um, in the Congress to consider my bill at the next markup. There's no reason why this shouldn't be a bipartisan effort. Um, now, my first question is to uh, Vice Chair Quarles. Um, as you and I have discussed, uh, vocal advocates on the left and some members of this committee continue to push the Fed to inject climate scenarios in distress tests and capital requirements Earlier this month, the Center for American Progress suggested that regulators could address climate change by risk weighting carbon intensive assets and capital requirements. Proponents suggest that regulators should use bank capital requirements to make the financial system more resilient and force the transition away from fossil energy. The problem is that will do nothing to change the demand side of the equation. People will still need to drive cars, turn on their lights and heat their homes. It will just disrupt the supply side by shifting financing for those industries to less regulated non-bank lenders, drive up the cost of capital and in turn raise prices for consumers. Vice Chair Quarles is the Fed's role to devise and implement climate change policy, and more specifically, is it the Fed's job to accelerate the transition away from fossil energy? Uh, our role is to ensure that the financial system is resilient to risks. Uh, those uh, logically could include climate risks, and so we need to analyze how that could happen. But it is not our job uh, to use the financial system uh, uh, as a tool of broader climate policy. That is, well, that, 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 that's encouraging to, to hear that confirmation on the record. And I would encourage you to share that with Mr. Styro uh, and the Climate Supervision Committee. I would encourage you to continue to vocally express that viewpoint uh, to Governor Brainerd and others at the Fed that you are not you do not have the legal authority to implement environmental policy. Um, let me uh, turn to acting uh, comptroller, um, uh, Sue. Uh, I continue to be troubled by the trend of politicization of access to capital, whereby perfectly legal businesses are denied financing because they are industries that are politically unfashionable. That's why I was pleased to see the OCC finalize the fair access rule in January. Uh, acting comptroller, Sue, given that the OCC announced that it will not enforce the fair access rule. Uh, how do you intend to prevent national banks from discrimination and redlining? How do you intend to ensure that regulated entities extend financing on a fair and equitable basis without regard to political or public relations pressure? Uh, and um, in the context of your prepared testimony, sir, uh, your emphasis on reducing inequality in banking sounds like hollow rhetoric and an empty gesture when uh, considering your decision to not enforce fair access. Can you comment on that? And the inconsistency of, the, of, of that testimony with your decision and the OCC's decision to not move forward and implement fair access. Um, sure. So uh, maybe I'll start with uh, uh, reducing inequality. So that, um, uh, the components of reducing inequality really focus first and foremost on the Community Reinvestment Act. So I'm not going to take up time with that. Yeah, but but I, I hear you. But you know what I'm talking about. It's a it's a philosophically inconsistent position to say that you're for equality in banking when you will not enforce a fair access rule and you and, and you will not uh, uh, prevent discrimination against whole categories of customers because of their, their politically incorrect status. 
It's um, intellectually I, inconsistent. I, I guess I would disagree with that. Um, the, I can tell. We don't, we don't, we, we, we don't, we're not in the business of telling banks who to bank. Um, we are in the business of safety and soundness, of uh, treating customers fairly, of ensuring that there's access to financial services, especially those who are underbanked and unbanked. That's right. our mission. My time has expired. My time has expired. But if redlining is wrong, redlining is wrong. End of story. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let me uh, first address uh, my question to Chair McWilliams. You know, there are approximately 250 FDIC insured MDIs and CDFIs that serve minority, low and moderate income communities. These institutions are pillars for the communities that they serve because unlike traditional larger banks, CDFIs and MDIs provide a significantly larger percentage of lending and services to these communities. While MDIs and CDFIs are assisted in receiving deposits without the necessary capital investment, these entities are unable to fully serve their communities to the best of their ability. The FDIC's mission-driven fund seeks to help in this by area by providing a framework for an investment fund that will support these crucial financial institutions. The fund will allow for investment pitches for, uh, for banks and help set up fund management. However, what's puzzling to me, and it's my understanding that the FDIC will be taking a hands-off approach after setting up the framework. Now, if that's the case, how will the FDIC ensure that the fund is actually successful at achieving its mission? Thank you for that question. And, and I welcome the opportunity to talk about the mission-driven uh, bank fund because that is something that frankly is, is novel to us. It's something that uh, we came up with as a result of, of extensive outreach we did with minority depository institutions to understand what particular issues they are facing. And to your point, because they do disproportionately serve the low and moderate income communities, it is important that they have good access to capital. And almost inevitably, uh, most of them uh, define capital, access to capital, as one of the, 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 the greatest impediments to their ability to serve their communities. Um, so the Mission Driven Bank Fund is going to be set up in a way that uh, we as a federal government agency can set it up, which is basically to put our name, our brand behind it. We have worked extensively uh, with our MDIs uh, as well as with outside uh, consultants to understand how to structure this fund. Um, I'm not sure that we have requisite authorities necessarily to manage the fund and, and be the fund manager per se, as, as, uh, as you would think about a fund manager in a financial sense. But we're hoping that the fund manager uh, that gets picked by the anchored, uh, anchor investors is focused on kind of a, um, uh, the benefits of, of the investments and, and, and has a long-term strategy, understanding the nature of this institution and making sure that the capital uh, deployed to the fund is actually producing even more benefits on the, on the ground than a dollar for dollar. So that is something that we're going to complete, uh, completely continue to work on and, and, and stress about uh, to make sure that people understand this, to make sure that the anchor investors understand that. Our hope, uh, and, and this is why I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it in a public forum, is to actually attract between 250 to $500 uh, million dollars in this fund and, uh, and get it started. We have a $100 million commitment from Microsoft, which we're very grateful for. And so we're hoping that it's going to be a significant fund with meaningful long-term benefits to the very communities that I believe you're concerned about. Yep, and I'm hoping the same. I just want to make sure that you don't take a hands-off approach because we've got to then stay hands-on to make sure we accomplish the mission. Uh, and so we're dependent upon the FDIC to not just take your hands off, but stay focused on it because this is tremendously important and could be groundbreaking. So uh, we'll be watching, and I hope that you stay actively involved in, in that regard of the FDIC. Thank you for Congress that. Congressman Meeks, I can assure you I'm not a hands-off regulator. Thank you. And let me go to Mr. Sue. And Mr. Sue, I know I'm hearing that you've been punting uh, this, this question recently, but you know that the Senate recently voted to overturn the OCC's True Lender Rule. And I know you've been punting on True Lender, which was introduced to clarify the status of loans made through bank fintech partnerships. However, the Trump administration's process for promulgating the rule was rushed and lacked adequate stakeholder input. 
including input from congressional Democrats like me. Still, the rule did attempt to address a legitimate public problem, uh, policy problem. If the House votes to overturn the rule and the president signs, will the OCC have the legal authority and tools to put forth a new rule that brings long called for legal supervisory certainty and enhanced consumer protections to the bank partnerships model? Um, Congressman Meeks, if, if the true lender rule is repealed, uh, I cannot say at this time exactly what we would do and how much litigation risk would come with that. Uh, what I can say is that we are fully committed to the mission of the agency, which is to ensure access to financial services, especially for those who are underbanked and unbanked, and that customers are treated fairly, which includes uh, not having a place for predatory lending and a rent -to charter. So the, the details, I think, are, are, are still, we need to review that, we need to study that carefully. Um, so I, I can't speak to that, uh, but I can, I can commit to the mission. Well, thank you, my time has expired. Thank you, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman McWilliams, uh, it's good to see you again. I wanna thank you for all the work that you and your team at the FDIC have done regarding the broker deposits rulemaking. Uh, as you know, there has been something uh, that I have been working on for many Congresses, and it's nice to see the regulatory regime moving in the right direction. And while you have done your job at the uh, agency level, I think we, uh, uh, in the we should have a legislative uh, solution. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to give you the opportunity to briefly discuss the broker deposit rulemaking and the benefits it will have within the banking space and that uh, would uh, hope to secure a commitment on, on if you are willing to work with my office in crafting a more permanent legislation fix, what I think is very important. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I really appreciate an opportunity to, to talk about the broker deposit rule. As, as you well know, and I know I have spent a lot of time thinking about this issue, uh, the, the rule, the original rule was about 30 years old, and there has not been a meaningful update uh, to that rule, even though the way that consumers bank now and the way that banks interact with their customers and the products they offer have been vastly different than they have in the past when the rule was initially promulgated. So what we did with our framework, we tried to create something that can have a longer lasting impact to accommodate the flexibility in the technological changes that may not be even anticipated by us at this time. So our rule uh, provides more certainty as to who is a deposit broker. It basically provides a roadmap how one can be a deposit broker or not, uh, as well as provide certainty to the marketplace uh, as consumers look to engage uh, with different financial institutions. Now, I will say that uh, however great our rule is, uh, uh, it's not perfect. And uh, namely, it's not perfect because we can never adequately appreciate and anticipate technological changes that are going to be uh, developing in the, in the world of banking and how consumers and banks interact. And I, I, I believe, as I mentioned in my written testimony, that a congressional uh, action would be, would be beneficial and preferred, frankly, to um, the current approach, uh, including uh, putting an asset growth cap on troubled institutions versus putting restrictions on broker deposits and labeling an entire category of assets uh, in, a, in a negative light. So I'm more than willing to work with you on coming up with a permanent and lasting congressional solution that would allow us to move forward with technological advances and innovation in the banking sector while making sure that both consumers are protected, banks are understanding how, how these things are done, and that gives us an ability as a regulatory agency to appropriately monitor the risk in the system. Well, thank you for that. We'll work together. Thank you. Uh, Comptroller Sue, a few weeks ago, I asked your predecessor, Brian Brooks, while he was in front of this committee about the true lender rule and if it would be uh, a good deal to repeal it through the Congressional Review Act. Uh, he told us he disagreed with not only the justification behind uh, repealing it from a policy standpoint, since the rule explicitly prohibits a rent-a-bank scheme, but also said that it would be, uh, would hamstring the OCC from crafting a substantially similar rule in the future. Our colleagues on the Senate side did not listen to your predecessor and went on ahead and passed the CRA anyway. So, Controller Sue, how do you plan on proceeding if the rule is overturned and industry participants are left without the clarity that they need to continue serving their customers? Um, so we're not, I'm not exactly sure. I can't say exactly at this time how we would proceed. Um, uh, and I can't 
we don't know uh, right now what the litigation risk that would attach to how we would proceed, but I can commit that we would pursue our mission. And the mission is to ensure that there's access to, to financial services for everybody and that everybody is treated fairly. And those are the, those are our kind of our, that's our compass okay. that we would be utilizing and we will do that in, in accordance with the law. Okay. Uh, Vice Chairman Quarles, the Federal Reserve took some extraordinary actions when the pandemic began since there was so much uncertainty surrounding the virus. Now that we're fully seeing light at the end of the tunnel in some places and life seems to be getting back to normal, I'm concerned some of the temporary measures are going to become common practices at the Federal Reserve. So it, it's hard to show restraint and put uh, pull out every tool at your disposal. So when the economy begins to look a little shaky, so uh, Vice Chairman, uh, what checks are in place at the Federal Reserve uh, so they take these extraordinary measures during true emergencies? Uh, well, the the governance around uh, the use of these uh, uh, actions is designed to ensure that there are uh, 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 there needs to be a, uh, a majority on the board uh, to indeed a uh, significant majority on the board for a number of special actions during the crisis. Okay. All right. I yield my time back. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the witnesses for appearing. I especially thank the uh, chairwoman of the full committee for deciding to host this hearing. It's exceedingly important. Uh, Mr. Quarles, uh, as vice chair of the uh, Fed, I am concerned about uh, your desire to work with MIT, Boston Reserve, working with MIT to create a central bank digital currency pilot project. I think that's a great idea. My concern, however, emanates from knowing that if you are successful, we still have the other cryptocurrencies that will be available to those who seem to see this as a means of facilitating a criminal enterprise. You might recall that with the Colonial Pipeline, there was a request and a requirement that the ransom as it were, be paid in a certain cryptocurrency. So we'll still have this problem to deal with, assuming you're successful in creating a central bank digital currency. I'm curious and would like to know dearly, how do you see us managing these other currencies? Uh, do we go so far as to declare them um, unconstitutional in some way, ban them in some way, um, make them counterfeit? What do we do with these other currencies that will still be available to us? Uh, well, it's a complicated question because there are a range of, uh, uh, of uh, types of instruments that count as cryptocurrencies. Uh, if I may then to help us narrow it, let's just talk about the, the type that's used by these criminal enterprises uh, to facilitate the transaction of money in an anonymous fashion. So uh, the, the, uh, the use of those uh, uh, payments mechanisms for, um, uh, you know, for illegal purposes is illegal and that you should be prosecuted. Um, we are in the process at the Fed of studying uh, the various ways to try to address this issue, uh, whether uh, uh, a central bank digital currency, although that's very uh, early on, thinking about the proper regulatory framework for uh, these cryptocurrencies, uh, which uh, you know, I do believe, as with any payment mechanism, it is possible to craft a regulatory framework that- uh, Give me some sense of how we can regulate them, please. Um, uh, well, I think it would be uh, 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 premature to say that, but uh, uh, to give a concrete uh, regulatory framework, we uh, have developed. Give me a, 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 excuse me, give me an example that's not concrete. I, I'm trying to get some sense of what we can do. This is a serious issue for those of us who are charged with the responsibility of making hard choices about these, these issues. So we, we need your expertise. Give some sense, please. Well, financial institutions that engage with these cryptocurrencies will need to comply with all applicable requirements. Uh, 
uh, including anti-money laundering requirements. We supervise them for that currently. How do you know your customer? Well, we require the bank to know their customer. And uh, if the instrument itself doesn't uh, allow that, they need to have another mechanism. If it's if the person comes in with cash, uh, the cash itself doesn't uh, identify the customer, but the bank needs to know the customer. And we have rules around that. So I, there is more work that needs to be done. And we, we are eager to, uh, uh, to engage with those who are interested in the question. Uh, but I do think that it is, a, I think the question is a thinking through a, a right regulatory framework and that such a regulatory framework can be uh, created. And um, assuming that we succeed with a central bank digital currency, um, is that currency going to be one that will be um, readily available to those who not only want it for legitimate means, but also for some untoward means, uh, meaning uh, will we be able to, in your opinion, circumvent the use of it for paying um, ransoms, for want of better terminology? Were we to have a central bank digital currency, we would clearly uh, uh, design it uh, to, to uh, uh, prevent its use for uh, for those purposes. It is, however, uh, whether whether we would have a central bank digital currency is is way premature to say at this point. Uh, well, my time is up and I thank you for uh, indulging me. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for having our agency heads come before us today for this uh, discussion. It's very helpful. Uh, let me start uh, with uh, my friend, uh, the Vice Chairman of the Fed, Mr. Quarles. Our, our consumer banks, our community banks in Arkansas have raised this issue among themselves quite a bit, which is with a 28% increase in the money supply over the last year and so much liquidity, both from monetary policy action and fiscal action pouring into the banks a lot of our community banks are concerned about the impact of this liquidity on their capital ratios. How are you looking at that and what kind of uh, uh, regulatory problems does that create? So, uh, I mean, we are monitoring the evolution of that uh, phenomenon across the banking system. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the principal issue is that the, the capital ratio constraint that arises when you have this large uh, increase in deposits is from the leverage ratio, which is a non-risk uh, sensitive ratio. Uh, and if the binding uh, capital constraint on an institution is not risk sensitive, then that will encourage risk taking by the institution at the margin. Uh, so we want the leverage ratios to be backstops, uh, but not the the capital ratio that institutions look at in the first instance. Um, so uh, that is, you know, as the amount of reserves uh, in the banking system, as the amount of deposits in the banking system grow, and they will continue to grow over the course of this year and, and have grown substantially over 2020, uh, you know, that, that, that's something that we have to be taking a look at. We're monitoring it closely. Uh, right now, it doesn't seem to call for a change. Uh, uh, but that it's something that we'll be looking at very closely in the coming months. Thank you. Uh, Chairman McWay Chairwoman McWilliams, uh, you've testified before Congress uh, before and expressed your concerns about credit unions uh, buying community banks. And obviously that's something that community banks in Arkansas have raised with me. Recently, a $1.6 billion bank was purchased by an out-of-state $10 billion credit union. Do you still have those concerns? And is the FDIC, how does the FDIC look at this from an approval point of view? And do you have the tools to adequately assess it? Thank you. Thank you, Congressman, uh, for that question. I have heard uh, about the same concerns from banks, which is why I commented to a question that I was that was presented to me in a prior hearing. Um, I would say that, that we always have uh, a lot of questions when there's an acquisition of a community bank in particular, and uh, in, I would say especially if that community bank is located in a rural area or an area where the, the, the banking deserts uh, are more likely to exist than not. 
during my first year as chairman at the FDIC, uh, in what I like to call the peacetime, when the economy was doing superbly well, we had uh, 220 banks uh, merged into other banks uh, and or credit unions, which is a large and significant number of community banks uh, that disappeared from America's landscape. Uh, and if that trend continues uh, during my five years as chairman, we would have over a thousand fewer banks uh, in the United States of America. Now, as you know, consolidation has been a long-standing issue. It's been going on for 30 plus years now. Uh, I don't know what the appropriate uh, number of banks is in the United States, but I do have concerns that um, some of the communities, um, farming communities, uh, inner city communities, rural communities, et cetera, uh, are not necessarily appropriately served by the number of um, entities in, in their area and any consolidation, any merger presents an issue for us from that perspective. So I would say my, my concerns have not changed. If anything, we have just uh, even been more um, uh, alerted to consolidation given the pandemic and its impact, uh, disproportionate impact Thank on different communities. Thank you for that. Uh, let me turn quickly with one, one final topic. Let me go back uh, to you. Uh, Mr. Quarles, I talked to the uh, OCC at a capital markets hearing recently, and this was about the transition away from LIBOR. And some community banks are concerned about uh, going to SOFR versus another rate. So my question is, in looking at Mr. Sherman's draft bill, he seems to imply that SOFR only is that legal certainty default in a contract to LIBOR. Does the Fed support a variety of alternatives uh, in that approach to replace LIBOR? Um, I, I think that it, we, we don't support every alternative because the rate has to be uh, essentially not readily susceptible of manipulation, but uh, uh, but we don't support a single alternative. Thank you. Yield back, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and appreciate this, this hearing, um, and, and it's very timely. Uh, let me try to get into it and do it, get as much of, as I can in, in here. Uh, Mr. Harper, uh, I am very pleased and excited about the, 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 the uh, update that, that uh, OCC uh, did, uh, they are issued a new rule, uh, so, th so that now banks, um, uh, can can get credit for digital uh, inclusion, uh, and that's that's a, that's an update which which it meets one of our, our needs. Uh, from some of us like me, I I represent Kansas City, Missouri, which is the largest city in the state of, uh, of Missouri, but then I also represent uh, Mayview, which is 225 people, uh, and and we so we have some digital uh, uh, obviously uh, needs uh, there, uh, so I'm I'm pleased with that. Uh, what what is the flexibility that banks would have to do a CRA like uh, like uh, you know um, digital inclusion? I, I don't know how, how, how you came up with that decision. Uh, how OCC came up with that decision, but I thought it was it was right on time. So what what is the flexibility? Hello. Congressman, I'm not, not sure if the question was for um, NTUH uh, uh, Chair Harper or for me at the OCC. Anyone, I don't, I don't, I, I, anyone. So, I mean, I guess I can, I can say that uh, financial inclusion is extremely important. You know, th this is a top priority. Uh, we've got a number of initiatives focused on it. Be happy to kind of talk through the details. I know time is limited, um, but we've got both uh, through rules, uh, uh, rule reconsideration, and programs. So, so we've got lots of uh, things that are in the hopper that we'd be happy to talk to your staff about. Okay. Uh, 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 the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think CRA, I've said this, and I think a lot of my colleagues agree we need a, a complete update on, on CRA. And, and as you may know, uh, our chairperson and, uh, and probably, hopefully, the overwhelming majority of the members of this committee are in strong support of trying to do something uh, significant as it relates to affordable housing. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe a different way that that CRA could, could be handled is making uh, investments in some of the projects uh, that might be um, uh, 
brought forth by, by, by HUD or community organization in concert with HUD. Uh, I mean, and, and so it may be something new, not just, uh, you know, making a loan in a, in a, uh, a difficult neighborhood. Uh, but do you think that, that, that there can be some creative ways in which uh, CRA can be involved uh, economically in, in, in the, the production of, of affordable homes? Any of you, anybody? Okay, uh, anybody I'll, else? I'll take a stab. Um, so affordable housing is a, a, a huge problem. Um, we've been focused on it uh, from a couple angles, one through Project Reach, where um, you both have to help the borrower. And so there's a program uh, dealing with down payment assistance. Uh, that can be quite helpful. The other is to increase the supply of available housing so that uh, it's, a, it's more affordable because right? there are supply demand dynamics uh, in the pandemic have uh, put things out of whack. There, these are very complicated underneath, but um, uh, we'd be happy to, to kind of, and we're open to all ideas on this. So, so really I uh, want to continue the discussion. Okay. Okay. Um, my, my time is probably about up. I, uh... You know, um, I, I, I don't think I want to do anything. I don't think anybody else wants to do anything that would, you know, not be consistent with uh, safe and and sound um, banking practices. Uh, you know, but but I think that if, if if CRA is going to be continue to be a benefit, um, you know, it has to change with the with the with the the, the, the issues that are at this time significant. And right now, affordable housing is, is a problem in just about every community, including rural America, where, which I represent. So anyway, thank you very kindly. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you to uh, all the witnesses for the attempts uh, here today. These oversight hearings are a great opportunity for members of Congress to talk base with the Hey, Tom, it's hard to hear you. Oh, really? I got my, my stuff cranked up. Maybe I'll yell. There you go. Can I yell? Is that helping? <laughs> sure, that's good. Yes. <laughs> All right. Listen, these oversight hearings are a great opportunity for members of Congress to touch base with regulators and determine how we can best serve the financial interests of the American people. I look forward to advancing this interest as the ranking member of the subcommittee on oversight and investigation. Mr. Sue, I also greatly appreciate the mention you made in your testimony to the work previously done by the OCC to clarify crypto custody services by banks. This type of guidance, which allows businesses to know the rules of the road, is key to enabling the United States OCC Acting Comptroller to continue to thrive as a technology leader. Now to all of you, uh, Mr. Sue and all the other witnesses, countries around the world are looking to blockchain technology to transform industry. Consider China, for example, with its digital wand. While there is much to work through as our government considers the benefits of this technology and potentially issues a digital dollar on blockchain, I hope that each of your agencies are developing expertise in digital currency policy. To that end, please describe briefly, if each of you will do this, please describe br briefly for me what actions you are taking to increase your agency's fluency in this emergency emerging policy area. And will you please provide our office with the names and titles of staff in your agency who are leading these efforts. And maybe we start with Vice Chair Quarles. Um, well, the, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, uh, we've got the, probably as, as was recently mentioned, we have the CBDC pilot uh, with MIT, that is to say the central bank digital currency pilot uh, with MIT, which is being led uh, through our uh, Boston Federal Reserve Bank uh, in conjunction with uh, with MIT. Uh, there is uh, uh, general policy work around the system in addition to that pilot project uh, in thinking about central bank digital currency uh, and you know, what the approach to that ought to be, uh, whether it's something that uh, is appropriate for the United States. 
um, uh, I think those would be the, the major points right now. Right, and you can provide us with some contact folks in your office. Oh, absolutely. We'd be delighted to be engaged with your office on that. Excellent. Uh, Chairwoman McWilliams. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, um, as you may know, the FDIC does not ensure deposits denominated in a cryptocurrency, but we recognize that the use of virtual currencies and digital assets has been growing rapidly in recent years among the banks, and that some banks, including some of our banks, are starting to explore a number of different potential uses for digital assets. And because this is a novel area, because we, we need to know what's going on uh, in this space, we decided to issue a request for information to solicit feedback regarding what banks are doing, how are they doing it, um, what do we as, as a supervisor need to know, as a deposit insurer need to know, as a resolution authority need to know? And I have personally tasked uh, a number of individuals at the FDIC with handling this issue for us, including my Chief Operating Officer, Brandon Milhorn, Chief Innovation Officer, Sultan Megji, Chief uh, Counsel, uh, Nick Potiadli, and one of our attorneys, Chris Ledoux. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. We can provide other names, uh, and I'm sure they'll be happy to talk to your people on this important issue. Excellent. Thank you very much. Acting Comptroller Sue. Sure. So this is a really, really important issue. I think that the, the rise of crypto, I think, uh, has got, garnered a lot of attention. Um, prior to this meet, uh, meeting, uh, uh, Vice Chair Quarles, uh, Chair McWilliams, and I had talked about potentially putting together uh, an interagency policy sprint team just on crypto uh, uh, because of the, exactly the concerns you described. Happy to share the names of the OCC leaders on that uh, and working with your staff on that. Right. Chair Harper. Uh, thank you. And just as the uh, financial services world innovates, we need to adjust to that. We actually, as part of this year's budget, created a new unit focused on financial technology and innovation. One of the charges of that unit is cryptocurrency. We're currently advertising for a director, um, and we are going to be coming out uh, similar to the FDIC with a request for information on this. I know that this has been an important issue for Vice Chairman Hoffman, and the board is going to be definitely working further on this matter. Right. We can get some contact uh, information. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the witnesses. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lynch. You're doing a great job as chair. Um, Very kind. First, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for your service to our country uh, in a very difficult uh, time. And I uh, uh, really want to salute the uh, financial services. Uh, I want to salute you. I want to salute, salute your agencies and your staff. That doesn't mean at some point I ain't going to come down like a ton of bricks on all of you. But I really do want to thank you uh, for your service. Uh, this has been a very difficult time for everybody. And you all have, uh, your staff has done a great job. Second, uh, just to let you know, uh, Mr. Davidson's on uh, the Zoom with me, uh, was one of my prime sponsors on the Safe Banking Act, uh, the marijuana and banking. Uh, we got it out of the house with a huge uh, bipartisan number. Uh, it'll be in the Senate banking and hopefully uh, Sherrod Brown and the Senate will take it up in some fashion or another and uh, ultimately we can uh, deal with the public safety hazards that uh, are caused by so much cash being accumulated by these businesses and the robberies that occur. So I just want to alert you all to that to be ready for that. Mr. Sue. In your testimony, you highlighted a concern about overconfidence leading to complacency as a potential risk regulators need to watch in the banking sector. One of the examples you used was Archegos or Archegos, which resulted in a $10 billion in cumulative losses. Can you explain how the OCC and other regulators can promote stronger risk management uh, by these financial institutions? Sure. So uh, it's primarily, first and foremost, through the examination process. Um, the, the, I, I think what Arkego shows was, was a lapse of risk management as a set of institutions. And you know, those risk, that risk management is generally well understood and applied in most cases. I think what the risk is that in some instances, um, uh, there's a, a bit of a looking askance or a weakening of those risk management where there's profits to be made. And that's that's not everywhere and that's not every institution. Part of my call for vigilance is both uh, within banks themselves and for supervisors 
to be vigilant in examining and calling that out and making sure that those weaknesses are identified early uh, before they turn into uh, a big losses. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Harper, it's a long way from the Financial Services uh, Committee to the chairing the NCUA, so congratulations uh, to you, sir. Um, I'd like to ask you about the NCUA's, and happy birthday, by the way. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the NCUA's supervision ability as it relates to cybersecurity. You've, you've answered it a little bit in some previous uh, questions, but it's my understanding NCUA's authority to supervise credit unions third-party vendors with respect to cybersecurity may have expired in 2001, is that right? Yes, we had temporary authority granted as part of the Y2K issue where we could go in and examine and take enforcement actions against vendors. Um, that uh, uh, authority expired um, after we got through the 2001 um, year 2000 event and uh, we have not had that authority since. I would say this, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, that um, in juxtaposition to our sister agencies, we're the only one without vendor authority, and that the FSOC, the GAO, as well as our own Inspector General here at the NCUA have called for us to get the vendor authority so that we can oversee matters like cybersecurity, but also uh, safety and soundness matters, AML, uh, Bank Secrecy Act matters, as well as consumer financial protection. Uh, thank you, and I would just encourage all of you, um, you know, there is what's called the NIST protocol uh, from the National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology uh, that we hope to get uh, many businesses, the, the third party vendors, uh, to start using to try to minimize the potential for hacking and, um, you know, cyber ransomware and all that stuff. So, again, thank you for your service. and. Uh, Mr. Lynch, Mr. Chair, I yield back to you. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Mr. Davidson for five minutes. Uh, I thank the chairman, I thank our witnesses and appreciate this uh, hearing today. Uh, Vice Chairman Quarles, in your testimony, you mentioned that the Fed is transitioning back to its normal activities and to its normal rule book, uh, of course, following a uh, substantial intervention in, uh, to provide stability in this past year. You know, of course, the Fed's primary objectives are to promote low inflation and maximum employment. Uh, I'd like to focus on the Fed's objective to achieve maximum employment. Uh, Vice Chairman Quarles, uh, the latest economic data from April shows that the labor force participation rate is just under 62%. This has been an ongoing challenge with persistent declines in participation this century uh, and we've never really fully recovered uh, to the level of participation prior to the 2008 financial crisis. Furthermore, this is five percentage points lower, uh, you know, it has been uh, hard to overcome even in 2017 to 2019. Besides distorting the unemployment data, uh, what are the implications about this lower uh, participation rate for our economy and how will it influence the Fed moving forward? Uh, so the participation rate is obviously one of the employment measures that we look at closely. Uh, for an extended period of time, uh, you know, that uh, participation rate has been under downward pressure just as a result of demographics. As the baby boomers age and age out of the workforce, uh, the, the overall labor force participation rate is inevitably going to uh, uh, trend downwards. Uh, uh, at the Fed, we have uh, uh, you know, adopted monetary policy both uh, before the COVID event and during the COVID event uh, with an effort to try to support uh, employment as much as would be possible. And we have succeeded in, you know, I think that the policies we've adopted uh, uh, moderated, indeed for a period halted, even minorly reversed that downward trend in the labor force participation rate, notwithstanding the, uh, the heavy downward pressure from demography. So. I, I thank you for your answer and really uh, would look forward to a more extended discussion as you appreciate these hearings. Time goes quickly, but, you know, really without more participation, we're having to have massive gains in productivity. Otherwise, we can't see GDP growth. Uh, so, you know, I appreciate uh, appreciate the answer and just uh, think it's one of the underappreciated, um, you know, metrics that if we rightly look at uh, labor participation as one of the keys to the mandate, uh, we could see it maybe a different policy set. I think it's also important for my colleagues to consider the implication 
uh, of many of our fiscal policies on labor force participation. Some states are wisely rejecting some of the toxic federal policies that are handicapping our, our recovery as we seek to rebuild our economy. Uh, some of the bank regulatory policy puts a handcuff on being able to make loans to otherwise creditworthy individuals. So let me transition towards that point. Mr. Su, in light of your comments about Archegos Capital today and, and other comments today, who do you believe that regulators should block access to banking or markets? Uh, who should be blocked? Uh, who would otherwise have lawful access? Um, so I don't believe we're, we, we, we should be in the position of picking who should be and who shouldn't be blocked. Our focus is on risk management and compliance. And so uh, under sound risk management and compliance, uh, we expect firms, because uh, their business models differ. Different, different banks, uh, bank different uh, players. We expect them to do due diligence and know who they're dealing with and, and how they deal with them. And that should be the mechanism through which uh, those decisions are made. Okay, as Mr. Perlmutter highlighted, we needed to pass the Safe Banking Act, uh, which we, thankfully we did here in the House. Uh, we're counting on uh, the Senate getting it across the finish line so that banks can bank people who are engaged in lawful activities in their own states. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we've seen bank regulatory uh, policies uh, block under Operation Choke Point access to all sorts of markets. And sadly, you know, America has uh, this unfortunate history of people saying, including many regulators, well, you're not gonna bank those people, are you? Now this label of who those people are shifts over time, but I strongly believe that regulators should be first consolidated. So we have one prudential bank regulator, not this whole panel with due respect to the representation here. But I think secondly, that regulators need to limit their activity to enforcing lawful practices and not creating the force of law with backdoor pressure tactics that might not be a ban or a block, but they have the same effect. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about systemic practices. This is certainly systemic. Uh, Ms. McWilliams, as you know, the OCC has conditionally approved a few crypto trust banks. Uh, the next logical step would be for these types of institutions to eventually operate as depository institutions. With that in mind, Ms. McWilliams, could you speak to how important it is for potential regulators to be on the same page with regulating this space. If you could, please respond in writing since you won't be able to uh, by the uh, chair's rule. Thanks. I will. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let's say I would uh, like to follow up a little bit more on uh, the on central bank digital currencies and related thing as it refers to um, as it refers to the need for a secure digital identity uh, no matter um, you know what your vision is for uh, for what a central bank digital currency should look like whether they're fed accounts whether they're um, you know a pure crypto asset or, or whatever um, you, you will still need to know uh, who it is that is uh, transacting uh, you need to know this not only um, in the United States, but if you intend uh, central bank digital currencies to be transacted around the world, uh, you need to have some agreement uh, or an internationally operative uh, central bank digital currency. And uh, Mr. Quarles, I guess you can start. What is the state of, of international negotiations on how that might work? Uh, extremely embryonic. Uh, the um, uh, the, the, uh, these questions about a digital currency are uh, important and we're engaging in them and we're engaging in them uh, with our international colleagues as well uh, uh, through the various central bank fora that exist. Uh, but in any jurisdiction, they're quite embryonic and they raise a number of technical questions such as the one that you've raised here uh, that need to be thought through. I think we need to do a very careful study uh, of that, uh, not just in this jurisdiction, uh, but I, uh, but globally uh, as well before we uh, before we would even begin to go down a path. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of struck by the fact that that NIST and the International Standards Organization actually have fairly advanced technical specifications for how a digital ID might work. Uh, these are often called mobile IDs. Um, and that, and then, in fact, some states are rolling those out 
a, you know, simply a mechanism for putting your real ID compliant driver's license onto your cell phone, using that as a very powerful second factor authentication. And so internationally, those are working very well. So I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that, you know, you're not uh, trying to leverage that. Um, and I, I, I would say uh, the discussions, again, among the central banks as to whether that would be a mechanism for a central bank digital currency certainly may be sensible, but very premature. We have, we, we have not been engaging in going down that road or, or, or in not going down that road. We're, we're still considering all of these questions. Yeah, well, I, I urge you to um, proceed with the with the digital identity problem in parallel with the technical structure of a central bank digital currency. They're really almost separable problems. You have to solve both, and solving them one at a time is not the most efficient way. You know, we have to respond to China in in their advance uh, into into this area. Um, does anyone have any other comments on on digital identity? Um, one one near term thing actually that we will have to be facing is when we, uh, I think we have a bipartisan agreement to have um, a, essentially uh, an internet connection as a guarantee, access to an interconnect, internet connection as a guarantee, and that the government will be putting um, you know, many tens of billions of dollars to make sure that's a reality. Um, with one of the main benefits being um, that you're gonna have 30 more people, 30 million more people connected to the internet. Um, and these, one of the big benefits from that is simply to have um, access, have them now potentially be, instead of underbanked or un unbanked, that they will actually be banked. But of course, these 30 million new newbies on the internet will be uh, ripe targets for fraud. And so the, the again, it enforces the real need for um, a coherent approach to, to digital identification. Um, do any of other witnesses have uh, comments on how that, um, you know, that problem looks, you know, these 30 million uh, newly newly banked individuals with um, rather thin files. Is, is there a plan for how that's going to, to work smoothly so we don't see just a torrent of, of identity fraud? Uh, I, I think you can tell from the enthusiastic response of the regulators that you have identified an issue that we should focus on. Okay, well, happy to be of service here. And, and we'll be uh, very interested in following up on your staff. I'm, I'm surprised at how far, and pleased at how far industry has, has gotten ahead of, of regulators in terms of, of the technical standards for, uh, for high quality digital ID. And, and I urge you to try to piggyback on top of that. And my timer is now running out and I'll be happy to follow up. The, uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Zeldin, for five minutes. Well, thank you to the uh, witnesses for being here today. And thank you, Chairwoman Waters and Ranking Member McHenry for holding this hearing. I'm going to start off by reading the mission statements taken from each Prudential Regulator's website. The FDIC's mission is to, quote, maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. The OCC's mission is to, quote, ensure that national banks and federal savings associations operate in a safe and sound manner, provide fair access to financial services, treat customers fairly, and comply with applicable laws and regulations. The NCUA's mission is to provide, through regulation and supervision, a safe and sound credit union system which promotes confidence in the national system of cooperative credit. The Federal Reserve System's mission is to, quote, foster the stability, integrity, and efficiency of the nation's monetary, financial, and payment systems so as to promote optimal macroeconomic performance. Uh, Chairman McWilliams, Vice Chairman Quarles, uh, Acting Comptroller Sue, uh, Chairman Harper, uh, would any of you like to share uh, briefly, your views on fair access in financial services for legal businesses. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start, uh, so long as the others follow. Um, our regulatory um, response, frankly, to uh, serving to banks serving all legal businesses, um, as mentioned earlier, has had a little bit of a hiccup in the past. And we have learned from that hiccup, uh, frankly. Um, our job as regulators is to implement the laws passed by Congress and provide a supervisory framework that considers safety and soundness in consumer protection laws and regulations, 
We encourage institutions to serve all legal businesses and individuals in their communities. We have even issued a statement on providing banking services that encourages um, our institutions to take a risk-based approach in assessing individual customers' relationship rather than declining to provide banking services to entire categories of customers without regard to the risks present. So I would say that uh, we have done a lot of work, including extensive examiner training in this area to make sure that the way our examiners look at banks uh, and how banks provide services to different entities uh, is, is appropriate within the safeguards Congress gave us. And certainly we don't want to be in the business of managing who the banks choose to bank so long as they, as they follow the law. Uh, and, and Chairwoman, on that point, there's a, a local business uh, in Suffolk County, New York. Uh, my congressional district, the first congressional district in New York is in Suffolk. Uh, they are uh, in the uh, firearms industry, and they have provided to my office uh, letters from multiple lenders, uh, all at the same time right now, terminating accounts, refusing to extend credit because of a review of business practices. Um, what what is what what is the answer to a lawful business out there in Suffolk County, New York, uh, having multiple lenders terminating their accounts because they are in the firearms business? So I would say that those decisions are left at the at the level of individual banks and how they decide to manage their risk exposures, uh, reputational risk, and everything else. That's not something that we tell them to do or not to do. I'm more than happy to engage with your office to understand exactly. Um, um, we don't even have to give me the name of the of the client, but maybe the names of the banks uh, and and the notices that have been provided uh, with the name of the bank redacted to make sure that we understand whether this came from the FDIC, supervised banks, or uh, one of our sister agencies. Um, so I'm I'm happy to follow up with you separately. Thank you. I appreciate that. The four mission statements I read all mention either integrity, confidence, or fair access in financial markets. Uh, there can't be true integrity or confidence in the financial system if individuals and businesses are being discriminated against, whether the discrimination is based on an immutable characteristic or decision to conduct commerce in a completely legal industry. The financial institutions that are indirectly regulating the livelihoods of legal business owners need to consider the irrevocable damage they are causing to the integrity and confidence in our financial markets, not to mention to those operating businesses themselves. The public power granted to banks and credit unions in the form of charters and deposit insurance makes perfect sense when it enables the financial services needed for a lawful commerce and a functioning economy. But this power is being misused when banks try to regulate downstream markets. There are legitimate reasons for financial institutions to reassess relationships with customers. These include credit risks or risks related to money laundering. But a political difference or worse yet, fear of progressive backlash from outside groups is not a good reason. The Second Amendment as just one example is not a suggestion. The banking businesses that legally sell firearms in order to regulate the industry indirectly is wrong. Uh, this is an important issue that requires uh, all of your attention. Uh, thank you for doing this hearing. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, for five minutes. Chairman, thank you very much. And you're doing a great job, Mr. Lynch. I appreciate it. <laughs> I can hear your voice quite clearly, which is great. Um, you know, I joined this committee about six and, and I, I again i want to thank all the witnesses again i appreciate very much you being here I, I joined this committee about six and a half years ago and when i did about the only thing that my republican colleagues wanted to talk about was dodd frank how dodd frank was awful dodd frank was terrible and for a while there i thought that they thought it was the spawn of satan or something like that because they thought it was so terrible horrible and i wasn't able to listen to, to, to all of my colleagues today, because there's another hearing going on in, in uh, foreign affairs, but I haven't heard Dodd Frank come up. Um, at least I don't think I, I, I certainly have. Maybe it did before. But um, Mr. Vice Chairman, Mr. Quarles, you, however, I think bring it up without saying it. Page one of your testimony entering the COVID event, the banking system was fortified by over 10 years of work to improve safety and soundness from both regulators and banks themselves and, and you go on to describe the, how we're able to kind of go through this covid 
because of some of the rules. Now, what, what were you referring to when you were talking about this? Was it Dodd-Frank? Uh, well, pr principally the higher levels of capital and liquidity uh, that were put into the system post-2008. Uh, uh, post some of that was uh, work uh, from the international regulatory community that was coordinated in uh, Basel. Some of that was work at the Federal Reserve. Uh, some of it uh, was mandated in the Dodd-Frank Act. So it was a, uh, a set of measures. Um, uh, but really, focus, for me, the, the key issues were the extra capital and liquidity that were in the banking system. And I, and I appreciate that very much. So again, it's interesting that we don't hear much about those uh, requirements. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I think the next big one is not Dodd-Frank. I think it's going to be climate change. Now, when we first started talking about climate change, and my, my friends on the other side of the aisle would first deny that it was going on. Then they started saying, well, it's the cows farting, or I don't know what it was, some ridiculous thing. But now they, they start and they're starting to accept that it's there, but they I don't think they really understand the risk. I don't think we understand the risk. Um, Chairwoman McWilliams, however, you, you talk about that. Um, you say on page four of your testimony, you say, the FDIC expects financial institutions to consider the appropriately addressed potential climate risks that could arise in our operating environment. This includes physical risks associated with extreme weather events such as hurricanes, floods, storms, tornadoes, droughts, and fires, and you go on. Now, you do understand some of these risks then, and you do think they're real. Um, yes, I mean, our, it, um, there are basic safety and soundness practices, and well, I would like to think that we are uh, a, a, a great regulator. I'm, I'm pretty confident that both the OCC and the Fed uh, required the same of their supervised institutions. And, and Acting Controller uh, Sue, you also write, climate change possesses new risks and challenges for banks, and we need to make sure they understand those risks and are capable of managing them. I think that's a quote from you. Correct. Could you expand on that? Uh, <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, yeah, so I think it's just as uh, uh, Chairman McWilliams uh, noted that for safety and soundness purposes, you know, we, we expect banks to stay on top of these uh, emerging risks. And I think as you had noted earlier, th there, are, there are many dimensions to this for both physical and transition risks. It's complicated and that uh, and it's different for different institutions. So I think we do need, uh, we and the firms need to spend some time investing in understanding what that is to identify, measure, and manage those risks. Well, I appreciate that. So again, I, I appreciate that you're taking this very seriously. I, I also think obviously there's risks and there are opportunities. In California, we're trying to take a look at both because there are uh, opportunities in this transition to a low carbon economy. But anyway, I, I appreciate the work that you've done. I appreciate very much that you're looking at this. It's a big issue. I do have a, an ESG bill and others have bills working on the environmental issues. And again, I appreciate that you're doing this because I think a lot like Dodd-Frank, we're gonna see that the risks here are real and we're gonna be able hopefully to find solutions for them so we don't run into huge problems going down the road. So again, I thank you. I have eight seconds left, so I will yield back. To somebody, yielding back to somebody. Thank you. Thank you, the gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd, for five minutes. Yeah, thank you, chair. Um, and again, thanking the, uh, the panel for being here. So, uh, Acting Comptroller Sue, uh, the OCC has received a number of applications for crypto trust banks. And after conditionally approving three, I, I believe it's three, uh, you can correct me on that if uh, it's a different number. I think they were Anchorage, uh, Protego, and uh, if I pronounce that correctly, and Paxos. So correct. what, is the time ti what is the timetable for approving the remaining charters that are out there? Um, I don't know the timetable right now. It's under review. It's under discussion. Um, I just got here. This is my 10th day, I believe. So we're, <laughs> we've got this uh, in the pipeline to look at. We're not going to drag it out, uh, that I can say. And so, uh, but it, as, as that timeline becomes clear, we can get in contact with your office to let you know. Well, I'll just stay in touch with you on that. I understand that mastery comes between day 11 and 12. So good luck with the rest of this. So thanks for, uh, for what you do. 
Uh, another question, and uh, maybe uh, hopefully this isn't a day 11 question, but uh, so just your thoughts on blockchain. It offers the possibility of significantly reducing the cost of uh, mortgage origination and consumer lending. Um, in mortgage origin origination, we have a company called Figure, and they've applied for a bank charter. Um, and since Figure uh, proposes to take deposits, there's no issue with the litigation over non-depository bank charters. Uh, is that application, I mean, uh, if you know about this yet, or if not, we can continue to discuss uh, a few other things. But do you know if that application is on course um, so that we can set a precedent for other low-cost blockchain-based uh, financial products? Uh, so that application is definitely part of the uh, set of uh, applications that are under review. We've had some preliminary discussions about it, so um, I prefer not to, I need to learn more uh, before kind of uh, signaling where that's going, but that, that is very much under uh, our review. Oh, very good. I think there's a lot of promise for lowering the, lowering the cost to consumers. Um, and, and I look forward to this and, and having more discussions on this. So uh, switching to uh, Vice Chair Quarles, um, Recent media accounts suggest that the Federal Reserve may not grant payment system access to OCC chartered banks that don't take deposits, or in at least one case, to state chartered banks that originated in the crypto industry. Doesn't the Fed grant access to the payment system to non-depository trust banks today? And if so, what's the basis for denying new banks of the same charter type now? Uh, so we do uh, grant access to non-depository trust companies. Uh, we recently issued uh, uh, a set of principles uh, to govern uh, account access uh, really for all institutions uh, as a way, uh, as, a, as a recognition that there is an increasing variety of institutions uh, that are uh, potentially interested in account access. Um, uh, we put those out for comment and are getting comment on them now. Uh, I think what is important, and we haven't made a decision with respect to account access until we develop this this framework. We put these principles out. We'll get input on them. We'll be very transparent about what the rules are. I think that's what's important as these new institutions come for account access. Very good. Thank you. So second question. Uh, there's a lot of regulatory ambiguity revolving around crypto. Uh, lots of different definitions. Uh, used by all the, the sub-agencies, respective agencies, just adds, a, adds to that ambiguity. Um, will you at the Federal Reserve commit to working on a unified definition for what is considered a cryptocurrency? Uh, well, as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Controller Stu just mentioned, um, uh, we are uh, engaged with the other agencies in uh, a joint effort uh, to think through some of these crypto uh, definitional and uh, uh, the application of our regulations uh, uh, in, in crypto areas. Uh, I'm sure that will be part of it. So there's a there's a, a lot of uh, joint efforts in this. Do you think you're going to end up, I mean, coming up with a definition for what is a cryptocurrency? Because that's part of the problem right now. Uh, that people don't know exactly what it is. They have different definitions. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Our, we're we're uh, sort of focused very intently uh, on these crypto issues uh, uh, with, a, with the uh, aim of having answers fairly quickly, joint views fairly quickly. I'm sure that will be achievable. Thank each of you for your time. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, Chairwoman and Mr. McHenry for hosting uh, uh, this important uh, hearing uh, today. Mr. Sue, uh, in your written testimony, you noted that the OCC have been monitoring increasing concerns about racial bias and appraisal, particularly and residential lending. I understand uh, the OCC is working with the stakeholders to raise awareness and ensure that banks have the valuation and data to fairly and objectively underwrite these loans. This is very con very concerning to me. Can you tell me more about the OCC work uh, to remedy inherent bias and what we can do as members of Congress uh, uh, to make sure that we provide an assistance in this endeavor. Um, thank you. Th so this is a really um, 
important issue. I think it's gotten some um, uh, added press recently, which I think really adds an important, it, it puts a higher profile on it. Um, I think this is going to take a lot of work because it's not something that we, the OCC, can directly affect by ourselves. There have been some interagency discussions and some uh, stakeholder discussions. Um, I don't have all the details on this, so I'd be happy uh, to get folks on my staff who are who are very knowledgeable on this, have been, have been monitoring this very closely, uh, to work with uh, folks on your staff to, to you know, explore options and how to, how to make some progress on this. Okay, thank you very much, because in some instances where African-American female in the house of praise and you probably know about it and yep. she got one of her friends who was a white female over and the praise was altogether different you know yep. and it shouldn't, shouldn't have been that way uh miss william uh, uh covid 19 virus is having a profound effect on every aspect of american life and and the u.s economy uh i've solved much of the impact uh, on states county and municipalities um uh, uh this landscape uh, is, is served and supported by the community lending financial institution that are part of the federal home loan bank system, uh, saving and loan, credit union, community development, financial institution, uh, and some insurance company. And looking at the funding of infrastructure with broader participation by this nation financial institute to prove the leverage of federal funding dedicated to infrastructure if, for instance, allowing FDIC insured institution to pledge federal infrastructure bond uh, to uh, the FHL banks and collab as collateral. Um, Congressman, I'm sorry, there was a little bit of a, of a sound issue, but um, as far as I understood your question, you're asking about the, the bonds and how much the FDIC can assist in pledging it as collateral. Um, it is an issue that, frankly, I don't know how much authority we have in this space. And I'm happy to circle back with your office once once uh, I can explore that authority and, and understand the, the full crux of your question. Okay. Uh, and and so, uh, but anyway, it might be a little bit more complicated more than I can uh, acknowledge. And so it'd be great if you can get some information back. But I'd like to go back to Mr. Sue. Uh, I'm happy to see uh, in your testimony that while the OCC 2020 final rule uh, on the Community Reinvestment Act took an important step in attempting to improve upon the framework put in place in 1995. You believe there is significant uh, room for improvement. What necessary step can the OCC take to strengthen the regulation imp implementing the CRA, including option for rescinding, uh, substantially revising the current rules of, and working with the Federal Reserve and the FDIC on a joint proposal? Thanks for the question. So, you know, the first thing we need to do is do a careful study of uh, what our options are. And uh, I, have, I have instructed staff to consider all options. So one of those options could include rescinding the rule and putting it back out for comment, notice and comment uh, as to how to strengthen it. Uh, and in that process, we could uh, join forces with the Federal Reserve and the FDIC, so it is a joint rulemaking. Um, but before we get to that stage, uh, I need to see the analysis about what, uh, how that could play out and what the pros and cons of doing that uh, would be. So that, you know, we, we're just trying to create, I want to make sure that all of this is taken into account and that we're, we're just doing it in a measured, deliberative way, uh, because I think everyone agrees that we want to strengthen the CRA. And so now, you know, it's a matter of like, how do we do that? And how do we do that in a way that's uh, consistent with the APA, consistent with the process, and, and we hear voices from everybody. Sorry, okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, and Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk, for five minutes. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the opportunity. I thank the panel for being here as well. And, uh, you know, it's once again disappointing to see the majority continuing its anti-fintech agenda by proposing legislation that eliminates the OCC's true lender rule. You know, a few weeks ago, some of my colleagues were outraged that the acting controller dared to do his job and defend the agency's rule as any agency leader would. But what's most ironic about this effort is to eliminate the true lender rule that, that it would hurt the very people who the majority supposedly wants to help. 
The biggest beneficiaries of bank fintech partnerships are consumers with subprime credit or uh, a lack of credit history who don't qualify for a traditional bank loan. It appears the majority now supports things that uh, were questionable in the past, like payday loans, because without the without the fintech, that's what those consumers would be left with if they succeed in their attempts to eliminate marketplace lending. Or in states of Georgia where payday lending is illegal, there may be no option for these people. Um, Acting controller is is the rule. If the rule is overturned, I hope you'll take action to address the legal confusion that will result. So, just wanted to make that that statement. Uh, moving on to another topic, Chairman McWilliams, I would like to discuss the FDIC and the other agencies' request for intelligence. Uh, or, or the, the, the information on financial institutions use of artificial intelligence. I appreciate that this is being done on an interagency basis, so AI policy can be coordinated, which is extremely important uh, in the technology era. So my question is, Chairman McWilliams, what do you hope to accomplish with this request for information? Really, the request is pretty broad, um, and, and the request is aimed at understanding exactly what's happening in this space, what do we need to be aware of. Um, I would say it's, it's, a, it's a learning expedition uh, where we try to um, and hope to get a lot of public input uh, to understand what we should be focusing on uh, and how exactly artificial intelligence can both be beneficial and what risks it carries with it. So I would say that uh, it's, it's a broad mandate that we hope to, to accomplish with this interagency uh, product. Uh, and we're hoping to be able to implement it in our regulatory standards to allow banks to rely on artificial intelligence to improve their supervision processes, but also how they serve serve their customers and consumers. Well, I appreciate that. And you know, artificial intelligence is a very beneficial tool if it's used in the right way, and it does give the the re, the proper results, and that we can test those results as well. Uh, former Democratic Treasury Secretary Larry Summers recently said central banks are bending to political pressure and stretching beyond their statutory mandate by focusing on climate change in order to be relevant on a current political topic. I actually agree with him on this. The Fed is not supposed to be influenced by political pressure, nor is the Fed the proper venue for climate policy to be made. Vice Chairman Quarles, do you agree with the former Secretary Summers that central banks are engaging in mission creep when it comes to these climate initiatives? No, I, I, I don't actually think so. I think uh, I, I think there's been more. Uh, I, again, I think there's been more made of, uh, of what's happening on climate change. You know, it, it is a potential risk that faces the uh, the financial sector. Uh, as a regulator, we should look at that uh, risk. Uh, see what the potential uh, uh, effects on financial stability might be, uh, develop a, uh, again, an analytical framework so that we don't respond to political pressure, so that we don't respond to headlines, uh, but develop a careful data-driven framework uh, for looking at a potential risk. That's what we're uh, in the process of doing. Well, I would uh, disagree with you on some of these these issues because of being on the Science, Space and Technology Committee, we have heard from many uh, scientists saying in today's era, which we've done good with climate uh, policies in the past. I remember in the 1980s being in Los Angeles, you could hardly breathe. It is not that way anymore. That it isn't the United States of America that is the problem. We are what the cleanest of the industrialized nations. It's nations such as China and others that are the problem and I think that's where our focus needs to be. If we're truly interested in global climate issues, then we need to be holding partners overseas accountable, not punishing American businesses in a nation that has done tremendous in cleaning the environment. And uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Casting for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panelists. Uh, um, I'd like to stay with you, Vice Chair Quarles, and uh, and stay on the subject of climate. I'm I'm delighted to hear your your focus on the risk being analytical and data driven. Um, I I I, I want to put my uh, my friend Mr. Barr at ease when he said that the Fed doesn't have the authority to regulate environmental policy. I just I just want to talk about numbers, and I just want to talk about the financial system. Um, 
as you know, the rest of the world is, is leading and we are now in a following mode and it's time for us to get back into a leading mode. So I'd like to just understand a couple issues to understand what you all are going to do analytically. We know from our the, the science committee I serve on with Mr. Potter that we have significant sea level rise measured in feet, not inches. That is That is highly likely within the time horizon of current mortgages. As you do your analysis, can you commit to us that you will be factoring in what impact that will have on the banks, on GSEs, and, and the insurance industry? Uh, and so the answer is yes, because we have uh, we have long uh, taken into account in uh, supervising institutions, in particular geographic locations, the risks of those geographic locations. Uh, as we continue uh, uh, to get more data and to learn more about the evolution uh, of, of the environment, as additional risks become clear, we will uh, we will ensure that institutions are including them in their risk management, and that we include that in our supervision of their risk management. I, I, I just want to point out, and, and I, I understand we're all being cautious because these are uncertainties. There's there's a real gap when we sit on the science committee and I say, what cities are you concerned about? And they say the entire eastern seaboard. And then I move to financial services and we say we're thinking about it. Um, that these 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 changes are coming and we have to grapple with it. Se second question: S and P announced in January that it was placing 13 um, major oil and gas companies on credit watch, negative credit watch, due to energy transition risks. Will your analysis consider the debt and equity risk if that goes away and what's going to happen to the holdings within the banks you regulate? Uh, well, we're developing the framework currently uh, to be comprehensive, but any uh, placing of any institution's uh, 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 exposures on credit watch is, is and will be taken into account in supervision of institutions that are exposed to those firms. Okay. What one of one of the concerns I have having come from the energy industry is that there is some natural cyclicality in the energy industry. And you can kind of watch like clockwork that the, the holdings in the regulated banks, when there's a negative cyclicality, get moved into their non-bank holdings, and all of a sudden the bank says, I've got an opportunity for you to invest in, you know, energy special projects fund five. And we all understand what they're doing, but that gets it out of some of the areas that you might have direct regulatory supervision. As you do this analysis, will you be looking to make sure that those assets that are encumbered as banks try to move risk um, into areas that may not sub be subject to Dodd-Frank supervision or other regulatory regimes? Can you commit to making sure that we, we keep an eye on those non-bank actors as well to understand where money is moving throughout the entire economy? Well, the, the, the Federal Reserve is a holding company and umbrella supervisor does look at the overall organization and not simply the, not only the, the, the depository institution subsidiary. Uh, so yes, when we uh, take a look at the uh, at the capital position or the overall position of a firm, we take into account uh, the risk position of a firm, we look at the overall firm. Okay, well, I'd welcome the chance to, to work with your, your office on that. We're spending a lot of time thinking about it. And as I said at the start, I think we are a bit behind the eight ball. Um, Acting Comptroller Sue, you mentioned um, in your opening comments that you um, were interested in rejoining the network for, or joining the network for greening the financial system. Can you just share with us a little bit of, of why that's so important and, and what kind of leadership you are seeing in an international framework that we um, need to come up to speed on in our country? Um, uh, I think the, the primary purpose is to, is to learn. Uh, that form was uh, uh, created in order to, to allow and to uh, facilitate central banks, supervisors from around the world, and they've got a lot of members who come and say, here's what we're seeing, here are some best practices, here's what we're dealing with. And the idea for us is we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If someone else uh, has come up with a good approach to these risks that we've been talking about, we want to leverage that as quickly as possible and kind of integrate that and apply it in a tailored fashion to our institutions, which, which uh, are going to have to deal with these risks. Well, thank you, and uh, I will yield uh, 11 seconds back to the chair. Appreciate your time. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now this is the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to visit with our panelists today. And I also appreciate the opportunity to follow a couple of my colleagues off the Science Committee. Uh, in her March testimony before this committee, Secretary Yellen highlighted following along on these lines, that climate change is a top priority for the Biden administration. 
and that regulators should be accessing, assessing risk to financial institutions. As any regulator who's appeared before this committee for the last 26 years knows, the 3rd Congressional District of Oklahoma, which I have the proud privilege of representing, is a commodity-driven economy centered on agriculture, centered on energy. So the actions of the Fed, FDIC, OCC have a real and significant impact on the businesses in my district. We're capital intensive. We have to have major resources to do the kind of amazing things we do. So I start with Acting Comptroller Sue. In your testimony, you explain that the OCC will act on the climate issue, a risk with a sense of urgency. Can you describe to me the ways in which addressing climate risk could manifest themselves in your supervisory and regulatory requirements? What's coming towards my constituents? Uh, could the witness suspend? Could the witness suspend? Could the witness Absolutely. suspend? Uh, Mr. Lucas, could you turn your camera on under the House rules? Uh, I'm sorry, to Mr. Chairman, yeah. and I apologize for that. I thought All I had right. it on. All right. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. The witness may proceed. Thank you. Apologies. So, um, uh, the financial, different financial institutions will be exposed to climate risk differently. And what we want to ensure is that they are appropriately, that they've got the risk, they, they know what their risks are. And so in some cases, uh, uh, that there will be a lot. In some cases, there will be a little. It really depends. And some of these are physical risks, and some of these are what they call transition risks. Um, that what was highlighted earlier, uh, these, are, these are real things, and we just want to make sure that the that banks are uh, identifying those and measuring those appropriately, not with a desire or an eye towards you know, putting the thumbs on the scales for different industries. But how you identify those risks, how you put your thumb on the scale, all regulators, has a dramatic effect on the cost and availability of capital. We can drive capital decisions in this country away from very successful, ever more efficient, environmentally conducting themselves sectors by how we do this. I've watched this before. So that's why I ask my question and I ask all of you to be very careful in what you do. The goal is not to use financial regulation to create someone's version of the world. The goal is to assess the risk so that the market economy can incorporate the demand from the public for a cleaner environment and proceed in that direction. Just an observation from someone who's mildly sensitive about the effects of the federal government on his constituents going back to the 1930s. Next question. Some sectors of use economy are seeing a surge in consumer prices. It's a result of high demand outpacing supply. This could be temporary or these price pressures could continue to build. Vice Chairman Quarles, in September of last year, a market survey conducted by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York showed that less than 25% of the respondents cited inflation as a risk for economic stability. If we were to do that survey right now, do you suspect the results might be a little different? And I come at this as a person who was in college in the late 70s and early 80s, who was starting to farm, who went through that inflationary period. If you're under 40, you don't remember how bad it can be. Touch on that for a moment, if you would, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, well, uh, it's kind of you to implicate in any way that I might be under 40. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I do remember uh, that heavy inflation. Uh, I think. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to speculate on what a poll currently would say, uh, but I will say that we do expect to see uh, inflationary pressures over the course probably of the next year, uh, certainly over the coming months. Uh, I, again, I think that our, our uh, best analysis is that those uh, pressures will be temporary, even if significant. Uh, but if they turn out not to be, we do have the ability to respond to them. I just remember the vicious correction that went on in the early 1980s as the economy picked up and the velocity of the, the economy increased and the dramatic expansion of the monetary supply. We've only put, what, $8 trillion uh, extra money into the economy in the last year and a half? You have to survive whatever comes. Yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. Yeah, the chair recognizes himself for uh, five minutes for questioning. Uh, Acting Comptroller Sue, uh, you said in your 
in your testimony uh, that the OCC will undertake a review of recent actions uh, uh, that the OCC has taken in the fintech space, and that includes uh, actions on crypto assets and and the chartering of of banks and payment systems, and and uh, specifically. Specifically, you, you state that you have, have concerns that providing the special purpose charters that were pro proposed by your predecessors, in part, uh, will, will put Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I'm, we're having trouble hearing you. There's an echo. We'll convey the benefits of banking without commensurate responsibility. What are, what are your thoughts? Okay, so I, I didn't catch your uh, whole question, but I, I, think okay. I, I think I have the gist of it. Wow. Okay. Um, I, so so uh, I, I believe that we, we do have a risk where, on the one hand, there is a, there's a thought that if we simply charter the institutions, if we bring them into the regulatory perimeter, it'll be fine. That that, that, that is the proper thing to do. Um, uh, I think there's a risk with that. I think that, that's easier said than done. At the same time, I do feel like there is a strand of thought that, well, we just won't charter any of them, right? We, 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 we will stick by our guns as to where things are. And I don't think that's the right answer either because this it's not gonna make it go away. It's simply gonna happen outside of the regulatory purpose. So we need to figure out a way where we can do this in a safe and sound way where we can uh, adapt to the innovation. The innovation is happening whether we want it to or not. And so I believe we need to kind of approach that smartly, um, which is why I'm kind of re-reviewing this to make sure that that, that that balance is being struck in the right way and that, we, that we're doing it together because we, we, this is happening not just at, for the, at the OCC, uh, it's happening in other spaces as well. That, that's great to hear. That's very comforting. Uh, and and I, I think I can speak for the, the other members by saying there's a real spectrum of opinion uh, with respect to fintech and the impacts of banking and how, how fintech fits into the, the existing uh, banking infrastructure and how it serves our, our constituents. Uh, but one thing I, I do want to point out is that in the past, I don't think the other comptrollers of the currency have really engaged uh, Congress. Uh, they certainly haven't engaged this committee. I, I chair the task force on fintech, and uh, there are a lot of people on this on this committee that are are uh, well informed, I think, and, and excited about the possibilities. So, if I could just offer a you know a bit of uh, uh, advice is is please engage us. Uh, I, I think it would it would help with the uh, the thoroughness and and the precision that we we all need on that issue. Uh, and also you would garner uh, the perspectives of all the members on this committee in devising the solutions that that we we all believe we need. Uh, you know, we, we have a wonderful uh, financial system. Uh, you know, the United States uh, markets are the envy of the world. We would like to make progress without without damaging the existing integrity that we have uh, going forward. So, so that's all I have and I'll, I'll yield back. And I believe the, uh, the next gentleman, I'm trying to, who was up next? Oh, Mr. Kostoff of Tennessee, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kostoff is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks to the witnesses for appearing today. Uh, Vice Chair Quarles, if I, if I could, if I could go back to you and maybe follow up a little bit on, on Congressman Lucas's questioning. We saw last month in April a 4.2% increase uh, pursuant to the Department of Labor report and consumer prices. Uh, you all, in your last discussion, have termed inflation transitory. So my, let me, if I can, follow up and, and ask you to characterize uh, if we see uh, rates inflation continue as it has for the next several months, at what point does inflation cease to be transitory or, or, or the corollary? How long do you expect 
inflation to remain transitory? Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't and, and we don't have a uh, projection for uh, how long is too long. Uh, I do think that it's uh, important for us uh, all to keep in mind, as was mentioned earlier in the hearing, that last month's uh, very high inflation reading was the highest since 2009. And yet after 2009, we, uh, in, we went through an extended period of extremely low inflation, uh, well under the Fed's target. Um, uh, so I, would, I, I don't think that we can say that one month or one quarter's or, uh, or, or, or two quarters or more is necessarily too long. We do expect to see higher inflation for some period of time. As, as I look at now, it, it is possible that uh, you know, going through a period even of transitory inflationary pressures over that kind of a period could lead to some change in expectations. I don't expect it. Uh, but if it were to happen that a change in expectations led to uh, a a more durable uh, inflationary uh, environment, then the Fed has the tools to address it. For me, it's a question of risk management. This is the best analysis we've got currently. Inflation will be temporary. What if we're wrong? If we're wrong, you know, will we, can, do we have the means to keep it from getting out of hand? We do. Uh, and history would tell us that we're, you know, the, the economy is unlikely uh, to undergo these inflationary pressures for a long period of time. Well, you you, you reference some period of, of time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you to further define what some period of time is, and, and let me just I'll, I'll give you one particular point of context, and that's from my realtor and home building community in, in my district in, in West Tennessee, and I suspect this is similar to what 434 other congressmen are hearing that their real estate market is red hot that they get multiple offers for for different listings and that's for existing homes the home builders say that uh lack of labor and rapidly increasing cost of lumber up 300 percent over the past year makes it almost prohibitive to build homes um, so with the response you just gave me how much longer um, can we expect that to continue? And, and at what point does the Fed need to say enough is enough? Uh, well, uh, I can't give you a projection for how much longer that's going to continue because we're coming out of an unprecedented event. There's not a, sort of a series of historical uh, experience that one could point to to say this is how uh, uh, this is how long inflationary pressures last after you've shut down the economy in the face of, uh, uh, of something like COVID. So uh, uh, you know, the question is, what should the Fed do about it? Our experience over the course of the last decade coming out of the financial crisis is that you know, a couple of times we thought we saw, wanted to stay ahead of inflationary pressures, uh, increased interest rates, uh, it was premature. Um, and I don't think actually that it would be good for the industries that we want to see uh, thriving in, you know, as the recovery continues, uh, for us to close off that recovery prematurely, uh, trying to stay ahead of inflation when, again, our best estimate is that we are not behind. Uh, again, but we could be wrong uh, because this is an unprecedented situation. So for me, the question is, do we, you know, are we prepared in case this turns out to be a more durable event? And I think the answer is yet. I, I and I, but I do think that if we were to try now uh, to stay ahead of the inflation curve, we could end up uh, significantly constraining the recovery curve. That's the end of my time. I yield back, and I, I appreciate your response. The gentleman yields. The, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Garcia, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses who are joining us today. Access to the banking system is a critical step in building access to credit and thereby access to wealth building. But there is still a high percentage of unbanked individuals. My district is 77% Latino, and it includes many people whose preferred language is not English. Last week, my bill that would make it easier for borrowers to get their mortgage loan service in their preferred language passed out of this committee. 
The Improving Language Access and Mortgage Servicing Act is just the first step. There is much more work to be done. As Americans, it is important that we work to facilitate economic inclusion at all levels, including but not limited to language diversity. We must continue providing resources so that institutions can better serve their diverse populations. A recent study at, on Latino entrepreneurs found that only 20% of Latino-owned businesses that applied for a national bank loan over $100,000 obtained funding compared to 50% of white-owned businesses. This lack of capital has forced many Latino-owned businesses to take on riskier loans against their will. And this problem must be addressed now because the Latino market for financial services is growing every single day. Latino-owned businesses have grown 34% over the last 10 years. We need to make sure that diverse consumers have equal access to capital. I look forward uh, to seeing the enactment of Dodd-Frank Section 1071 in an, in an updated CRA, but I want to take a holistic approach at financial inclusion in our society. My first question is for Vice Chair Quarles. Uh, can you talk about the culturally systematic, culturally systematic or language barriers that prevent large banks from making room for diverse consumers? Uh, well, uh, f first, uh, ensuring that uh, there is broad access uh, to financial services uh, uh, for uh, all consumers is an important part of our supervisory responsibilities as regulators. Uh, language access is clearly uh, an important part of that. Um, in areas where, um, uh, in areas where there are significant parts of the population uh, that that uh, don't speak English, we um, uh, we do that and we, we include that in our supervision. And we have uh, data collection from small businesses as well uh, for information on you know the overall. Uh, 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 access to the economy uh, of those whose first language is not English. Right. So, what steps are y'all taking to make sure that there is access uh, to to uh, capital? Well, well, I mean that that as you know, as I said, that is part of our supervisory engagement with firms to ensure that uh, that all of the issues that may uh, be obstacles uh, to making financial services available to all the, you know, on a fair basis to all consumers in the area are addressed and language uh, accessibility would be part of that. Right, I'm sorry, but it, I, I know that that's your role and it's your responsibility. My question is, what exactly are you doing to meet that responsibility? We supervise the firms to ensure that they, that they address the question of language accessibility. Oh, okay, and then your supervision, what is it that you look for? What is it that you raise a red flag on? What is it that you use as a, a, a good uh, uh, model for others to follow? I mean, could you give me some examples of what you do in your supervisory role to make sure that there is diversity in, in language inclusion? Uh, well, it sounds as though you want a level of concreteness that, that we'll, we'll send something up to you on. It's part of our fair lending and CRA uh, examinations on uh, uh, of every institution, uh, but we'll, uh, you know, we should send you up something uh, at, at a more granular level. Right, and, and remember, and you know, the supervisions myself, and so I, you know, so we should have the supervisors provide you a detailed analysis of what it is that we do. Well, great. I look forward to, to receiving it. And Mr. Chairman, I've only got like twenty seconds, so I just wanted to ask quickly, uh, Chairwoman McWilliams, um, what is it that we could be doing more to ensure? Uh, that the programs like the Mission Driven Fund are targeting communities with language barriers? Oh, thank you for the question. And it may come as no surprise to you that I have a little bit of experience reading forms in a non-native language uh, on a daily basis. Um, well, I do, so that makes two of us. <laughs> then you know my thing. Um, so I will say that, uh, well, I'm happy to provide a, a, a response in writing to you. No, or, or even meet, if you, if you want to meet on this, this, on this topic. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I've run out of time. General Lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth, for five minutes. 
Uh, well, I appreciate the attention, appreciate all the uh, witnesses for being here today. Vice Chair Quarles, I wanted to come back to your answer to Mr. Kustoff's question earlier. I thought you put it extremely well in making sure that you're finding the right balance between not constraining the recovery, but also down the field paying attention to the inflation risk should it become durable. I think that is very, very important. I know there's a lot of concern about this right now. I hope that that concern remains transient, um, but I think your focus on ensuring that this robust recovery that we are seeing continues unabated is really, really important. So thank you for that very thoughtful answer. I wanted to turn my attention to a potential proposal that's being discussed by my colleagues across the aisle. I noted that in your testimony, you said the banking system is more liquid and better capitalized compared to last year. And certainly I've heard a lot of concerns from borrowers, heard a lot of concerns from lenders over the last couple of months. One thing I haven't heard about though, is a significant excess of bank lending that's led to a disconcerting weakening in the credit worthiness of, um, that they are underwriting. Yet I understand that one of the bills being considered by my friends across the aisle is one that would tie mechanistically without discretion increases in the counter cyclical capital buffer to the increases in the Fed funds rate. I really oppose this effort and I wondered if you might talk a little bit about what you're seeing out in the environment right now and, and talk a little bit about the variety of reasons you might increase the Fed funds rate, not specifically correlated with excess bank lending or a weakening of credit worthiness of sponsors, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, the the both prudential and macro prudential supervision are, uh, while there are, are connections, they aren't uh, algorithmically related to our uh, monetary policy. Uh, uh, and uh, there may be circumstances uh, in which a change in monetary policy uh, could lead to developments in the financial sector that would cause us to say, okay, time to take some macro prudential uh, uh, steps. Uh, but the uh, others when when they would not uh, we were uh, making changes in monetary policy over the course of uh, uh, you know in the lead up to March of 2020 uh, we had done that uh, okay. we it would have been a mistake at that time uh, to turn on the CCYB uh, to be uh, concrete uh, because when we went into the event the problem was not a shortage of capital uh, the problem was, in fact, that we needed to turn down some of our capital measures in order to allow the system to use the capital that it had to uh, to continue to support the economy through that uh, through that stress. Exactly. Uh, so I, I I think just to to summarize what you very articulately put, though, is that moves in the rate may be correlated with weakening in credit standards by depository institutions, but that correlation is not perfectly one, and there are a panoply of reasons why you might. Um, raise rates that are unrelated to a weakening credit standards or excess bank lending. Is that fair? Sorry, I had to find the mute button. Yes, absolutely. Great. Uh, second question I just wanted to ask quickly. Earlier this year, I sent a letter with a few of my colleagues asking for an update on margin eligibility requirements for a segment of OTC securities. As you know, we've talked about it many times. These rules haven't been updated since 1999. I know that you've sent me a response. That response was, we're going to get around to it. We've been waiting for a long time for us to get around to it. Do you think that we're going to see progress on updating a proposal for updated margin eligibility requirements? Uh, so we are continuing the interagency discussions around that. As you know, one of the elements of the, of the statutory framework is that we also consult with the SEC. Um, uh, I think. There are some additional recent events uh, around uh, sort of margin exposures uh, uh, on securities uh, have, and the general review of the margining framework have, have caused us to think that we need to incorporate this into that. Uh, so it's, it's not fallen behind the refrigerator and been forgotten about, but it is, I think, part of a larger discussion. Great. Last question and maybe a little bit lengthier one, but for the time we've got. Uh, is there is there a real reason to believe that with economic growth in excess of 6% and though we're seeing inflation on the rise, hopefully in a transient sense, that the experience for the consumer as wages continue to rise, even with in the face of prices, that people are really mostly concerned about the real differential between their wages and inflation, not just concerned about kind of what the inflation rate is in an absolute sense? Well, I think that's part of the. I, I think that's part of the expectations uh, question: is our you know uh, inflationary expectations being affected by the pressures that we will see over the course of the next several months on on prices and wages? 
Um, uh, that it's, it's a possibility. I continue to think that it's not the probability. Thank you for your time. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, for five minutes. Okay, um, Mr. Torres, you're not you're not uh, visible on camera. Can you see me now? Uh, I can see you now. Yes, thank you. You you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the for the regulators regarding the Archigo collapse. Um, you know, when I think about the collapse, the it raises the question of how so many banks can give so much leverage. Uh, to one financial institution betting uh, on so few underlying stocks. And I'm wondering, in light of the, the ARCAGO collapse, are, are any of you planning to put in place rules requiring greater disclosure in relation to derivatives in general and credit swaps in particular? Um, well, I, I, can, uh, I, I can start on that. We certainly, in light of the uh, you know, of, of the events that we saw are reviewing both our regulatory and our supervisory framework uh, uh, to ensure that it would be hard for that to happen here. I do think that it is uh, important to keep in mind that the great bulk of the losses that were incurred in connection with our Kagos occurred outside the United States. They were not within the U.S. regulatory perimeter. Uh, the firms that were within the U.S. Regulatory, regulatory perimeter did not lose, well, one firm did, but but the, the great bulk of the firms did not lose money, uh, which indicates that our supervisory stance with respect to those firms and our regulation of those firms is actually uh, uh, probably not uh, materially deficient. But whenever you see something like that, even if it occurs in another part of the world, you want to make sure that you uh, are on if top can, of your frame. If, if I can interject, I mean, why not? have greater transparency, you know, as a layperson, it seems to me, I ask myself, is it, is it responsible as a matter of risk management for banks to enter into credit swaps with, with RKGO without knowing all the credit swaps that RKGO had entered into and without knowing that RKGO had bet on only a few stocks in all of those credit swap contracts? It seems to be uh, financial institutions have an interest uh, in knowing whether uh, a company like RKGO is sufficiently capitalized and excessively leveraged. But that's exact. That is exactly what we're looking at. the The point that I was making is is that uh, uh, th those are perfectly reasonable points. We're we're looking at them currently. They did not result in material losses in the U.S. financial system. Our supervision and regulation of these firms, uh, you know, did not result in those losses. But perfectly fair to say, what can we learn from the fact that it happened elsewhere? Are there changes we should make? Perfectly fair question. And we are looking closely at it. Do you think if there had been greater disclosure around the overleveraged position of RKGO that those losses could have been prevented? Uh, well, as part of the risk management of the firms, I I, I do think uh, that uh, you know the, the prime brokers should have a clear view of when they are taking collateral against something. You know, is that is uh, you know. Are, are there risks to that collateral position that can't be told simply from their own exposure? Uh, and it does appear that these firms, although that wasn't something that was happening again within the U.S. regulatory perimeter, that does appear to be something that these firms, where they took the losses, were not doing. Now, I know so, RKO, as a family office, and and as a result of the credit swaps, was exempt from the 13F reporting requirements. But but the banks that bought stocks on behalf of RKO were subject to those requirements. Did did your office review the 13F filings and did you notice that multiple banks were buying an unusually large volume of the same stock? Did, did you see those red flags in, in advance of the collapse? Well, since the exposures were not within the U.S. regulatory perimeter, no. Uh, it, it would not have been possible for us to. That was something that was happening elsewhere. But. Um, uh, uh, but it is something that we are looking at how to ensure that were something like that to happen within the U.S. regulatory perimeter, that we are on top of it. And RKGO was a family office. Do you think uh, the failure of RKGO should lead us to rethink how we approach family offices with respect to financial regulation? I know there was a carve out for family offices within Dodd-Frank 
uh, based on the assumption that family offices would make conservative investments, but there was nothing conservative about the behavior of Archego. Should our approach be rethought in light of this experience? Uh, well, I would think it would be premature to say that if the banks that had exposure to Archegos had themselves um, uh, done a better job of risk management, they would have known what those exposures were. They would have extended less credit uh, on the basis of any particular collateral. Um, you know, that, that would be something it's not that's while that's not within the Federal Reserve's uh, sort of regulatory ambit. It would be something for others to look at, but uh, but I wouldn't jump to that conclusion from this event. I would jump more to a conclusion of the bank's procedure. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, for holding this hearing today, and certainly appreciate the testimony of our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Quarles, I'm going to stay with you with, with my line of questions and uh, stick on the, the LIBOR topic again. Uh, I, I know the, the Fed has a strong focus on ensuring an effective transition away from LIBOR uh, to alternative reference rates. As you know better than most, this is a, a fairly complex undertaking, but one that is proceeding, which is nice to see. Um, I also understand that the Fed supports the recently announced proposed extension of U.S. LIBOR, um, which will provide a swift trans transition away. Alongside the extension, uh, I personally believe there's there's more that we can do with respect to these legacy contracts, and I think you share that view. Um, can you please elaborate on your plan moving forward to facilitate greater certainty uh, with respect to this long tail legacy issue? Uh, and do you believe that ultimately congressional action is necessary? Uh, so the, the short answer to the last question is yes, I do think congressional action will be necessary. Uh, the uh, extension of the provision of LIBOR that you noted uh, will allow the, the bulk of the legacy LIBOR contracts to run off between the end of this year and 2023 because we are uh, insisting now that firms not write new LIBOR contracts after the end of this year. Uh, but by bulk, that's probably about 60%, maybe it's a little more than 60%. Uh, so at least 30, 40% of legacy contracts that will either need to be renegotiated and that renegotiation could be difficult uh, uh, they may have existing fallback language, but the fallback language may not be satisfactory. And there's really no way to address that other than legislation. Uh, there's New York legislation, uh, but not every contract is under New York law. There's some questions about how that works with some contracts that uh, uh, raise SEC issues. Uh, so federal law would be an important part of how to address that, that uh, tough legacy. Thank you. And in terms of uh, fallback language where contracts are silent or where a, a, a new reference rate uh, has not been agreed to between the parties. Um, presumably in our federal legislation, we would want one standard, correct? We wouldn't want a set of standards necessarily because we would want certainty in the market or do you have a different position on that? Um, we want clarity. Um, you know, I, I suppose conceptually you could uh, obtain clarity in a, in a number of ways. I do think that when you're trying to deal with something as complex uh, as the LIBOR transition, uh, a single standard is, you know, is helpful just as a matter of logistics. Uh, I wouldn't want to say in this context that you can't think of another way to provide the necessary clarity. Thank you. Um, and then I want to switch. Uh, to central bank digital currency, uh, if you would. I, I just would love to hear your perspective. Obviously, China started rolling out theirs, and, and I don't know if you saw this morning, I'm sure you did, their announcements with respect to cryptocurrencies broadly uh, and the effect that that's having on, on those crypto markets. Uh, so I'd, I'd just be curious, how do you see the central bank digital currency question vis-a-vis -vis the United States and our role as the global reserve currency uh, but, but also its role in the financial system. So, um, uh, so beginning with the caveat that those are complicated questions that I wouldn't want my answer today to be viewed as, as final or definitive on. Uh, I think that the factors that, you know, cause the dollar to be, you know, the, the world's clearly central reserve currency uh, will not be significantly affected were we to uh, develop a central bank digital currency. Uh, I, I don't think that we are uh, falling behind China or having uh, the, the role of our currency internationally threatened. 
uh, by the measures that China is taking currently to digitalize their, their currency. We want to stay on top of that. We want to understand what they're doing, what other jurisdictions are doing. We want to understand what the role of a, uh, of a CBDC could be in our own domestic economy. There are a lot of things to study there. We could end up doing it. But I, I don't think that the driver of that decision should be uh, that we think that there is a, a live threat from the technology around the currency uh, to, the, uh, to the dollar's reserve status. So what do you think should drive that decision ultimately? Uh, well, I think we need to see whether there is, uh, whether there are efficiencies in the payment system, uh, both domestically and internationally, uh, that could uniquely be uh, addressed or very usefully be addressed by the central bank providing a digital currency. In many cases, you know, the, the answer that, you know, that might not be. We do have a, a very heavily electronic and in many ways digital payment system. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields, the chair recognizes the woman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Chairwoman McWilliams, as you know, the FDIC is known. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairwoman McWilliams, uh, as you know, the FDIC is known by many for its role in ensuring deposits, but it also plays a key role in consumer protection. The FDIC has stated that it is responsible for evaluating supervised uh, instructions for compliance with consumer protection, anti-discrimination, and community investment laws, uh, among other duties. Um, however, it appears that FDIC supervised banks are, are now skirting the line of compliance with consumer protection. Uh, and so let me ask you, given the FDIC's stated role in the identification and the elimination of dangerous and discriminatory practices, what steps uh, is uh, FDIC taking to make sure that banks are not using partnerships uh, with fintech companies as a backdoor to reintroduce uh, predatory tactics. So I can assure you, Congresswoman, that uh, we don't take consumer protection lightly, and I would be more than happy to engage with your office to understand the specific instances where you believe that FDIC supervised banks um, have been able to skirt consumer protection laws with impunity, because I can assure you that has not been the case, at least not under my chairmanship. Uh, I think there is a lot of misinformation about um, the, the fintech partnerships. Um, I, I think one of the prior colleagues of yours men mentioned the benefits of having fintech partnerships in terms of the, the benefits to consumers. You know, we have a large pro uh, uh, proportion of the United States population that uh, cannot afford $400 on a monthly basis for family emergencies. And in those cases, you want to have access to credit available to them. And quite often, the fintechs um, are able to provide um, uh, different methodologies to, to be able to bank uh, consumers with uh, lower credit scores. So I think there are a lot of benefits. But I, what I believe you may be referring to is uh, a rulemaking that we promulgated, which is the valid when made rule. Um, and uh, this particular rule, um, I believe there has been a lot of misinformation about it. It does not expand payday lending uh, um, in FDIC regulated banks. It does not authorize the um, um, the use of, of a bank charter for other arrangements. And we have spoken very openly about viewing unfavorable entities that partner with um, a state bank to evade okay. a lower interest cap. So if that's what okay. you're talking about, I'm happy to engage in okay. explaining right. what the rule does. We'll, we'll do that. Thanks very much. Uh, um, uh, Acting Controller Sue, as you know, OCC plays a key role in ensuring that banks uh, play by the rules. However, recent reports indicate that banks are rapidly expanding their partnerships with financial uh, technology companies that may rely on predatory lending practices. Uh, we have some examples, but let me ask you, does it concern you when a national bank you regulate teams up with another company to engage in risky uh, lending that has been shown to generate discriminatory outcomes? Uh, yes, absolutely. Discriminatory outcomes are, um, uh, they, they, that, that should not be an outcome uh, for, for any bank, especially for a national bank. Uh, so yes. Now I do think 
there are some partnerships that are healthy and there are some partnerships that are unhealthy. And we, our role is to ensure that those partnerships are healthy, that they, they are not leading towards predatory lending or, or those kinds of outcomes. Okay, would you be concerned if a national bank partnered with a FinTech lender that claims its products are neither loans nor credit and then attempt to evade federal and state consumer financial laws? I think it depends a lot on the facts and circumstances. So if there are particular instances, we'd be happy to look at those and make sure that uh, they're doing the right thing. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, controller, uh, asking controller Sue, do you have any reservations that a bank under your supervision is renting out its charter so tech startups can employ these risky practices? Yeah, so I, I should reiterate uh, predatory lending and rent to charter, there's no place for that in the national banking system. Okay. So, um, uh, in light of what we've discussed today, do, do you have, your, do, do I have your commitment to carefully examine partnerships between banks and fintech startups, and in particular to scrutinize instances in which banks and new student loan companies uh, may be teaming up to make an in run uh, around consumer protections? Um, so on student loans, I, I need to check with my staff as the specifics on that. Um, but in general, yes. I mean, my understanding is that there's guidance uh, and there are rules around this, and we would expect uh, banks to follow those, and our examiners would examine for that. Um, Thank, you. Yep. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. By prior agreement between Chairwoman Waters and the witnesses, uh, we have a hard stop at 1.30, and we are just past that right now. So I, I'd like to thank our just First of all, I want to thank our members for their, their really thoughtful questions. This was a great hearing. I also want to thank our distinguished witnesses for for their insightful answers and for their testimony today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses through the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. And I would just ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. So without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And with that, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.